Did it. Yay, go live! Woohoo! It's working! Hello, everyone, and welcome to. Well, the first live of the Christmas season. And I'm going to be nice, and I won't wham you. Even though I have been whammed. It was quite cruel. It was terrible. Thank you, everyone. It was a traumatic experience. It happened in November. I will warn you two things now. One, I have still got half a pizza remaining because it was my lunch and I might get peckish. Knowing it's there. It's more the fact I know it's there than I'm actually hungry. Two, there is going to be sarcasm in this video. There is going to be a lot of sarcasm in this video and I feel I should prepare you for the fact that there will be the sarcasm will be coming out. And three, depending on the questions, there might be a... A, a, a rather section of ran of random ranting. That's do Rochelle. It's all I've just come here from a recommended video of Kane West and Why? Oh good lord, that that sounds like a very traumatic experience because don't take this the wrong way. Anyone who's talking that much of Hot air is definitely not fun to watch. Right. Well, I was actually starting at seven, but please note, it actually took me a while to get through YouTube. <laughs> Street Xplit was working for once. Xplit worked fine for once. It was YouTube which had the fun time, isn't it? Right. In for some reason, YouTube is now displaying the chat in stereo. I have no idea why, but I have two versions of the chat. Okay. Hello, Carl McGasberg, Cam Light6831. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, John Shea. I wonder if the free Deutschlands and five hundred hills what all Germans could afford. No, actually, they would have afforded a lot more if they'd stopped, actually keep stopping and starting and 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 stopping and starting. Honestly, look, this week has not been good for my blood pressure. I will say this on two fronts. One, because whilst... I would like neither Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union to actually be an effective military fighting force. I'd rather they collapse as quickly as possible. I have spent this week doing videos and prepping and researching and doing a lot for the Soviet Union throughout the period and for the Germans in this video. And it offends my sense of humanity in a way that... They are sending people off to die, who I may or may not disagree with. The, probably the vast majority of them are just regular people who are caught up in things, as most people on the are when things are going on. In ships which are not designed for the job and are not up to it. And it defends my sense of propriety when they are build, uh, building not just the wrong thing, but they're building the absurdly wrong thing. And the absurdly inefficient thing. And it just... It feels wrong. On so many levels. Come guys, with three pounds of sheep, five hippers, three Konigsberg, two flight, two Konigsberg. I knew him by Leipzig. True, there are the light cruisers. Hello, Ruhum. Hello, uh, hello, DG40. Hello, Abzaski. Mark Agnes. Hello, Steam Richards. Hello, Morgan McKenzie. Hello. Dogs learn the word walk. It just hasn't been the same since. My dogs now know the words walk. Claw, Meander, Wander, Rendwar. <laughs> they know what W A L K K L A W means. Um, <laughs> they are very versatile in all the phrases. Stroll and what double L O R T S means. And let's see, let me just bring in my copy of Cruise of the Third Reich for this lecture. Oh, good lord. Uh, <laughs> Mahana, someone said in the course of any project it becomes necessary to shoot the designers and just get on with building the thing. I can understand that, but in this case, most it's a case of getting on, uh, dealing with the politicians. Hence, because of all this, I have chosen this shirt. 
Yes, Christmas is started. Merry Christmas season to everyone. And so my Christmas shirts are out. If you see the same shirt two days running, it's probably because it's on a recorded video. Because trust me, I have 35 of these things and it's very rare I get to wear them all over the Christmas period between the 1st of December and the 2nd of January. I try, but I don't usually get there. And that's before anyone buys me any more of them. Because they are a favourite gift of my family for me. Hello Tanaverka. Hello Brian M. Ha Steve Clark. On the fifth day of Christmas, the Kriegsmarine gave me five heavy cruisers, four shell strips, three Deutschland class raiders, two gross admirals, and a leader with one... I'm not reading that one out loud. That will be definitely cause YouTube to be upset with me. Hello Ryan Taylor. Hello Amelia Burrow. Hello RG. <laughs> That's your YouTube recommended for some reason. Um, let's put it this way. I have found the YouTube, and we are all bowed to the logarithm gods. It, it can be a mercurial creature. It can be a mercurial creature. Hello, Roger the Shrubber. Hello, Ollie L. Hello, ooh. So anyway, what do you think of Orin Motorin Master and Commander series books? They're good. Hello, David Brown. <laughs> How did Eugene get the range so quickly on Hood during the Battle of Denmark Strait? Very good officers, very good directors, and a little bit of luck. Look, it's the scary thing, but you could have run that scenario another hundred times, and the odds of them getting the range so quickly would be less than one in two, one in. Oh, probably one in 20. But that time they did. And they were lucky. There were a lot of things at Denmark Strait which went the German way through luck. McGill, where is it? Your dogs here read back to front? Of course they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> we Look, let's put it this way. I have got a trick with the dogs of getting them both in from the back garden when they're particularly chasing squirrels of pressing the doorbell. They have learnt now that unless uh, I have to now press the doorbell multiple times because just pressing it once is not enough. Amelia, your Amelia Burry, your thoughts on a quad screw four triple turret hipper design? Um, well, at that point, if it's twelve eight inch guns, four screws, it's definitely going to scare the bejesus out of some people. That's the thing. The Germans weren't signatories of the Washington Treaty. And when you were allowed to replace... Whilst they are theoretically have a 10,000 ton limitation for the replacement of the pre-dreadnoughts, the fact is, the moment you allow them to fit 11-inch guns on it, you're basically already... They're already ignoring the Washington Treaty. So they can ignore what they like, really. Because the British don't want to go to war with them over that. Actually, I think it's more a case that sometimes you need to just kick out the politicians and freeze your requirements so you can start the building. That definitely would seem sensible. That would seem sensible. But, no. it Basically, if you want to start talking about German cruisers, and German heavy cruisers in particular, so you've got to get round this. It's the 11-inch gun. It's the triple turret design. And it's... A scary thing when you think about it, because it is the biggest gun Germany can build for about a decade. Okay? There is a reason why a battleship class, the Scharnhorst and Eisenau, and a cruiser class, the Deutschlands, all come with these 11-inch guns. The aberration in the middle is the hippers. It re they really are the aberration in the middle. And in many ways... And this is a problem I get into and I'm talking about the cruiser design. My favourite design of ship, and I'll be getting into this later, of the Germans produced in this period, the Scharnhorst and Eisenau. The ones I like the most shouldn't have been built. The Hippers, which I find the most frustrating because I just don't really understand where the weight goes. I 
I know where the displacement goes, and I can tell you the story of how it goes up, and we've already discussed this in, in various things, and I've discussed this even more in the video to come on Saturday. But, honestly, there is no sensible reason for the weight to climb as it does. There just isn't. And the displacement to be so inefficient as it is. Now, you can make the case that Deutschland class would be better with 8-inch guns. But then they wouldn't be stand-ins for the pre dreadnoughts they're replacing, would they? They wouldn't be. So, then you're the, build, uh, sort of building what I would call an Alaska class equivalent. Now, I think you could make a perfectly good Deutschland for another shaft... A few more engines, a few more diesel engines, and another turret. And if you're going to turn around and say, well, then they'd have 911 guns, so they'd basically be a Shan Horse class, yes. Because if you were built up, if you were thinking about it purely from the German perspective, wasting money developing 15, 16 inch guns for battleships when you are never going to be able to number in enough, and the moment you start churning out these ships, the British are going to churn out far more than you can. And please, no one start joking with, oh, they were building against the French. The moment they were building the H-class battleships, they were no longer building against the French. It's kind of like when people turn around to me and go, and I've had this discussion on Twitter today, and someone going, well, you know, it's the Anglo-German naval race is a problem. And I go, well, no, if you consider the sheer multitude of dreadnought races going on, in the 1900s, uh, the, the whole ships race which have been going on since really the 1880s and naval procurement races that have been going on since then. The fact is the only one which gets quite so nasty is the Anglo-German one because the Germans start announcing their building against the British. Well, the moment you start with that legacy in mind, what's going to happen the moment the Germans start building the H-Class? The British were watching Termitz and Bismarck being built and were getting worried enough. And that's basically the entire raison d'etre behind the fact that the King George V's are being followed by not just the Lions, but also the Vanguards. The idea you need to build capital ship numbers up quickly, hence building the Vanguards, and you need to build something with 16-inch guns, hence the Lions, which is going to be an ultimate British ship. Well, if the H's come out and they've got 16-inch guns, what, what, the Germans are building something with six, six ships with 16-inch guns. Yep. So what have you turned around to? Well, you know we built, we ordered Batch 1 lines. Yep, Batch 2 are coming right now. And every step of the way, as long as you have peace going on, because you're not going to build the H-Class, etc., all these things in wartime, you can't, you don't. Their resources just aren't there to supply the army of all it needs and a navy, because a navy is a secondary thing in German policy, it always is. Well, then the likelihood is that whatever you build is going to be outbuilt by the British many to one. Because their infrastructure was not destroyed by Versailles Treaty. Yes, it has been damaged and severely downgraded by the Washington and London Naval Treaties and the economic downturn. But that's actually a lot easier to build up with from than the Versailles Treaty, which was basically a scorched earth policy. So then we get back to these 11 inch guns. And if you wanted to, you could actually build battle cruisers or light battle cruisers of Panzer Sheaf with nine 11 inch guns. And they would be your heavy cruiser, they would fill your heavy cruiser and your sort of capital ship role. They'd be a pseudo capital ship, pseudo heavy cruiser. And if you could keep churning those out, you could have churned out a lot more than with the efforts you stuck into building. First the Deutschlands, then the Hippers, and then the Scharnhorst and Neiser now because you cancelled the last two, the second next two Deutschlands, and the Bismarck and Tirpitz. You could have built a lot of those ships, and you might even build a carrier. Lord help the German sailors who go to sea in the Graf of Zeppelin, but you might have even built a carrier. And that large cruiser, that German equivalent of an Alaska class, 
would have actually been very, very useful. Because it wouldn't have been a mighty unit, which is incredibly scary. It would have been scary enough. It would have taxed just as much resources from the Allies to absorb and to watch for, because it's got nine 11-inch guns. It's going to demand capital ship task force responses, isn't it? But it's going to require a lot less resources from you to develop and keep running, because you've already got the turrets. You've already got the guns. You've already got all the systems to support them. Discord boops coming through. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I haven't exited Discord. Hello, Cyclic. For those who know my server, you will know who Cyclic is. Ooh. I'll leave that there as well. So... The question with the 11-inch guns really is, if you're going to go for them, go all in on them. If you're not, then don't do them. With the Deutschland class, it's far more sensible to go for an 8-inch cruiser. It's far more sensible if you've got the 8-inch guns, but you haven't got the 8-inch guns. And if you're not, if you're going to use them as cruisers, build them as an 8-inch heavy cruiser and build a treble cruiser and have 9 or 12-inch 8-inch inch guns. They're far more efficient. But if you're going to build them as a ship which is a quasi or pseudo capital ship, then build them as a pseudo capital ship with 9 11-inch guns. Admittedly, you provide justification for the British and the King George V, because the whole reason they felt the 14-inch guns were justified was in part to deal with Sharnhorst and Eisenhower, which only had 11-inch guns. Mm. Uh, seriously. You know, every time they ask you, should, who would you like to meet at a dinner table? You know, have all the list of people you'd want to have a conversation with. That is one option, true. But I prefer the version of the dinner table of who would you like on a dinner table within swinging range of a large axe. And this, this really is a very different version of a dinner table. It's... You will get to, if you learn, listen to what I say, you will get to finish your food. If you do not, you are in range of this large axe. That is a very different dinner table. Not one one can do in real life without getting charged in murder, but it's one one can contemplate occasionally. Because as I've said several times, and I was wearing a t-shirt the other day, there are many issues which are worth resolving. You can't. But they're worth resolving. So, here is plan Z. Now, please note, I know someone's going to comment about this not being a balanced fleet. And I think I do myself in my own recorded video. But I also like leaving it as not a balanced fleet. Because what is it supposed to balance? The Soviet Union, which they are supplying all the equipment with to build. And they know how terrible their building program is. Poland? Who has got a navy which literally you can number the destroyers and other things by just using one hand? They fight bravely, but that's not exactly a fleet you need to balance them. France? Well, France are only allowed six capital ships, so... Nope, I don't think you need ten to balance the French. Thirteen if you include the battle cruisers. You're building, well, two Graf Zeppelins. Please note, I am, I'm not joking when I say that the Soviets at one point, and I'm going to get be talking about this in the, in the 1939 part two video, the Soviets do consider procuring <coughs> a Graf Zeppelin, a style aircraft carrier. So we could have had a Baltic carrier duel between two Graf Zeppelins. All oh, please, a moment's silence for the poor sailors who'd be on those ships. Fifteen Panzer Chief. Well, that's a great thing. After they've stopped building Panzer Chief because they wanted to build the two small battleships, the Sharnos and Eisenau, and the Hippers, they then realised that, frankly, heavy cruisers don't help them, so they want to build more Panzer Chief. Mm-hmm. Light cruisers. Well, 
and I got six of those. But they're planning them as seven M class vessels. So they got the Iamden, which is hanging around apparently. I'm not sure why they're planning on keeping Emden, but probably because it's the first ship they, the German Navy actually managed to build since World War One. And then you got the Scout Cruisers, which are based on the Spa Cruiser, 1938. Now, the 22 of those would actually be really, really useful. Destroyers, they just want 68 of those. And Torpedo Boats, 90. Now, I would point out here, there are some issues. There are a lot of issues here. And yes, by the way, they did want a few hundred submarines to go with this, apparently, as well. And the idea is basically, well, it's a fusion of Donitz and Raider, because Donitz is all this obsessed with submarines. Uh, that's what he's probably talking about. And Raider's obsessed with surface raiding groups, which is a balanced force. And the idea was you'd have Panzer Chief out there reacting the surface raiders, and you'd have task groups of battleships and aircraft carriers with some light cruisers and some scout cruisers with them as their escort out to support the Panzer Chief. It's all a lovely idea in theory. In practice, that might work against the French, but what's it going to do against the British? And also, why are you taking your time building up to 10 battleships, and let's say you do complete that by 1948, which is your plan, how big will the Royal Navy be to be, be in 1948 if there's been no World War II and they've been building up? Let's think about that. You know, let's say you do spend till 1948 building 200 plus submarines. How big will the Royal Navy's anti-submarine warfare flotillas be by 1948 under those circumstances? Because the Royal Navy will be sharing out flag class corvettes with every member of the Commonwealth like they're going out of fashion. They'll probably be up to the castle class. They might even develop frigates in the meantime. Plan Z is one of those plans which sounds great on paper. It's kind of like all these plans. I often get turned around, people turn around and go, well, you know, where's the British equivalent to Plan Z? Well, the British don't have an equivalent to Plan Z because the British are just building their ships to maintain their position. And they will build as little or as many as they need to maintain that position because that's what they'll do. So they don't have this grand plan because... How can the British have a grand plan when their grand plan depends on the undisclosed grand plans of Germany, Italy, and Ru probably Russia and Japan? You can't really have a grand plan when your grand plan is to defend your empire against four, four potentially annoying so uh, sources of great annoyance. You just have to adapt to what they're doing and how use your intelligence to find out and hopefully outbuild them. So no, my German cruiser built in the idea of 12, 11 inch and 29 knots is 20,000 tons is scary. It would be. I tell you, sure, but the politicians didn't want a gun smaller than the ones carried by the pre-dreadlocks. Nope, they didn't. Ryan Tyler, how did Charles and Eisenhower seem to end up as such comparatively efficient and good ships when virtually everything else they were built on was a bloated mess? Because they wanted to build them so quickly. They were such rushed jobs they didn't have time to interfere in them. So did the good designers got to design it and no one got to muck around. I'm saying, well, the Dunkirk was the counter to Deutschland's, and the Scharnhorst are built to counter Dunkirk. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't go quite that far. That's often put in. Uh, that's often put in the history books. I do realise, and there are some statements around to that effect that you can draw on from the time. But I would say that's not quite what it is. That's certainly their marketed reasons. That's their marketing. But that's not the real reason as they're built. Mark Harkness, build the true heavy cruisers the British cannot have because of the Washington Naval Treaty. The Deutschlands were superior to individual UK cruisers. They needed to handle packs of cruisers. Mm-hmm. And that's the actual real problem with all this plan. It doesn't matter whether you build a Deutschland of 11-inch or 8-inch guns. 
The odds are, if it's got eight-inch guns, then the British are going to think of it as being an engagement with a county and going to sort of go, well, hang on, how many eight-inch guns does it have? Nine? Okay, maybe one on one a county has a chance. If it's got 12, okay, then probably we need a couple of counties. If you're talking about, you know, this is the trouble when you're dealing with a navy, which the Royal Navy's aiming for 70 cruisers. The Germans aim, even with the scout cruisers, which were basically going to be equivalent of the tribal class in, in the Royal Navy sort of mental, mentality and thinking of it, is... 33 cruisers, 55 including the scout class, and they've actually built 12. They built 12. And one of them is the Endon, which is lovely, but it's the Endon. RG, better yet, try and invent the guided missile class, the H class, and try and get have some weird, weird, weird early missiles. Watch it for one that really wants to really mess with everyone. Yeah, but that means first you need to conceive of a missile armed warship, and then you need to develop it, and that's going to take time. And well, theoretically, till 1948, you might have had time. I tell you, would the Deutschlands have been viable with a new mount for the old pre-war German 8.2-inch guns? Um, you could fit anything really you wanted on the Deutschlands. You know, anything that's below an 11-inch can be fitted into that space. See, Richards, if the uh, Deutschlands are built with nine 11-inch guns, do the British keep the Tiger? That would definitely be a problematic, at some of the stages of the London Treaty, if the second London Treaty would not get imp implemented. I think if the Deutschlands had been built with nine 11-inch guns, I have a feeling that a supercruiser um, definition would have appeared and the British, etc., would have been allowed to build some. I, I just have that feeling. Either that or Tiger, etc., would have been kept, and Tiger would probably not upgraded to 14-inch guns. Test bed for the guns, which would be later fitted onto um, the KGVs, so she would have the twin turrets put in. <laughs> now, just Plan Z was never really balanced over the optimistic. It was Plan Z is impossible to achieve because for Plan Z to have been done, you would actually need to start investing in infrastructure in the nineteen, well, probably nineteen twenties, and actually built some infrastructure. I too. Germans can't build them then. You can't. I ain't building a free triple 11 inch turrets on 10,000 tons. The point is, though, the Germans are already building something which has got 11 inch guns. It's their key. They're already, it's already going to be over 10,000 tons. It's just a case of how much do you want to lie. And you could lie and claim it has no armor and you've got nine 11 inch guns. That would certainly be something I consider. Because who's going to call you on it? And also, the point is, if the British and the French do call you on it, then they have to go to a war to fight it. And the Fre that would mean the French would have to trust their own armed forces. The French government don't trust their armed forces, and the Germans know this. The British don't want to fight a war, because they're not ready for it. That's the, that's the realistic thing you're dealing with, even in the early 1930s. And the Germans know that. Do compassion, the Graf Zeppelin, more 150mm than the German light cruiser fleet. Mm, to an extent. Uh, Christopher, hi all. Late because the research assistants decided to conduct an archaeological dig in the trash. Those research assistants. A 
they were supposed to be limited to 10,000 tons. They were supposed to be limited to 10,000 tons by the Treaty of Versailles to replace their pre dreadnoughts yeah. The trouble is, the British by this point were already getting to going, uh, they, it wasn't really something they wanted to enforce. And again, Germany knew that, because the Germany knew the sentiment going around in Britain, and the Britain was, France wanted a treaty which would squeeze the German orange till the pip squeaked. Which is lovely. But it's not lovely to enforce, and it's going to require a lot of effort, and by this point, no one wants to enforce it. Knights of Grant, a five Queen Elizabeths, two Nelsons, five nineteen thirty nine KGVs, six Lions, four Vanguards, two Renowns, and one Hood would be what they'd have. Uh, are you quite sure they'd have had that just by 1948, Knights of Grant? Because by 1948, I'm fairly sure they'd have put the Queen Elizabeth's replacements in. Because remember, that's another nine years on from 1939. So they would probably have got... Again, if you consider it without the build, uh, the building break caused by the pause at the beginning of World War II, the capital ship and carrier pause by lovely Churchill, the British would have kept building continuously. And as the yards got back into the swing of building capital ships, they'd have sped up and the British had more yards to begin with and more industry and starters. And again, something which is I haven't really talked about much about, but Henderson in about 1934 goes around British industry and is giving out grants to build up things like armour, plate manufacture, etc. These things take years to come online. And they do come online in about 1937, 1938. But, which is good, because if they hadn't come online, we wouldn't have had all the armour and all the stuff we need to build, build tanks, let alone the, the battleships and cruisers and other things we need to build. And carriers. But the thing is, if you'd had peace in 1939 till 1948, because of everyone was still building up, the British would have replaced the Queen Elizabeths. The British would have replaced the Renowns. The British might well have replaced Hood. Let's say they might even. Re I doubt they'd have replaced Nelsons, but. The Nelsons would be the oldest ships left in service, and the slowest. Hi, Richards. Paul Ketchum. I think the Plan, uh, plan Z has more in common with the Nazi build up of Nuremberg for their thousand year Reich than actual military realities. It's a prestige fleet, first and foremost. Exactly. Christopher, England often seems to end up falling back on responding to what that annoying foreign gentleman decides to do as opposed to having a case of foreign policy plan. Well,. You could say that, or you could say it's a realistic policy. The British standard is they just keep building ships. They decide how many they're going to build based on how many their opponents are building. Because, again, why waste your money? If you don't need to build a massive navy, because no one else is investing in navy at all, then you just keep your yards ticking over, and your shipbuilding keeps ticking over, and just keep it going. If everyone starts investing then you already have a basis to build up more from. It's a strategic plan rather than a procurement plan. It's a reaction building. It's not a reaction operation or doctrine. It's a case of we build what we need to when we need to build it. And it works when you have the infrastructure industry to do so. Please note, it's only viable as a plan as long as you invest in the industry and infrastructure to be able to build what you need when you need it. Or within a few years of needing it. If you don't invest that money, then you don't have anything. So you can say, these people have these lovely plans on paper, but can't build them. But the British have, haven't got the plan on paper, but can build whatever they want to. That's the differential. But guy then, does the US still build on the Two Ocean Navy if the world isn't at war, at least in Europe, but is arming in the late 30s and 40s? Probably. The thing again is FDR, how long is he gonna be president for?
Cody, looks to me like the German naval engineers needed to have KISS beaten into their heads. Not quite beaten, but honestly, it that, keeping it simple would be preferable. This, of course, is Deutschland herself, the earliest of the Deutschlands. And I would say it's very easy to see the German design philosophy. You've got the torpedoes up the aft, which is actually a fairly good place to put them. You've got the balancing there of the guns at the same level, the 11-inch guns. And whilst I agree it would be tight to fit another one in from 2,000 tons, I don't think it would be impossible. Because there are lots of efficiencies which could be made in that design. Um, Duke Benjamin, did the French ever consider arming Dunkirk with 15-inch guns, and how can they, uh, how can be put on a single Dunkirk? Um, they did look at it, but it's a case of again, you'd have to build, you'd have to, um, how do I put this? You'd have to have actually built, uh, of actually built the gun and got everything ready before you could do it, and the French didn't have those available. Uh, Paul Ketchum, disregard my previous some of days. Well, I know it's not on the same in terms of Nuremberg. It's later than Nuremberg Plan Z, but I think it's still part of the same policy of building up the Thousand Year Reich and the glory of Germany and a greater Germany. Yeah, people for them do. Nice to see you. How are you finding my books? I'm enjoying them. Nice to you, The Spankrauser cruisers, uh, Scott cruisers, are so poorly armed they were losing to a well commanded destroyer. I'm fairly sure the tribal class would have massacred them in the nicest way, and Lord help them if they ever came across something like a battle class, or dare I say it, a daring class, if that had been built at the same time. Because again, you could think about where are the Royal Navy destroyers going? Well, by 1948, they could have daring class destroyers in service with those twin 4.5 inch guns. Ouch! There are a lot of ships here which would have been massacred. Mark Harness, the USN did the research when they built the Super Frigates. The honor response should have clue, uh, have a, uh, should have been a clue by a four for the Germans. Sturdy history, folks. It will clue you in. Well, yes, basically the. The Americans built some very good super frigates, which were able to build beat all the British frigates, and the British responded by sending huge numbers of ships in line to go, Hello. We're a pack of third rates. You want to play this game? At which point the frigates go, We're not designed to fight you. Because they're not. The frigates are designed to impress navies and impress presence around the world by looking magnificent, but they're not supposed to fight ships in the line. And it's the same with these ships. The Germans, what are they building a Deutschland for? Because a Deutschland class is probably the most mucked up of the ideas of the lot. It could work as a surface raider. It could work, and surface raiding is a sensible thing for the Germans to be looking at, because let's be honest, surface raiders give you range and capabilities which submarines don't. But, okay, this is powerful enough it's going to require either a pack of cruisers on the British side or a capital ship to be present. But it's not really powerful enough to deal with a pack of cruisers. Because think about it, you go, well, we've got two six inch, uh, two, uh, two triple 11 inch turrets. Cute. So, pack of cruisers. How many targets are you planning on engaging at once? Think about it. When Yamoto class, when the Japanese are deciding that they want to engage two battleships at once, they have one turret which is, going, is supposed to hold off. An opponent, while the other, uh, while two other turrets engage another opponent to kill it, and then you you carry on like that. Believe it or not, everyone can do the maths. It's the same when you're talking about six-inch turrets and the British with the Crown Colonies and various other things going on, working out what is the minimum number of turrets. So when someone turns up and goes, "Yes, but I'm limited to ten thousand tons, so I can only fit two turrets." Well, yeah, but then you've just designed a ship which can't do that surface riding role. 
because it can only really engage one ship at a time. And the Battle of the River Plate is a good example of this because they don't engage multiple ships. They either engage in Exeter or, the Li or Ajax or Achilles. They're not doing a multi-engagement firing. And yes, you can say, well, they had damage to directors and all these things, but yeah. But if you're going to design a ship to go off and do the surface raiding mission, you've got to make it actually viable for the surface raiding mission. And the 11-inch gun is far more in the cruiser category than the capital ship category at this point. So again, building a ship with nine 11-inch guns and just keep building them in low rate production, yes, it's going to wind up the French. No, they're not going to do anything about it other than build stuff. And it will fit for your... It can fill in for your heavy cruiser role. And honestly, it makes sense. And it means you don't have to worry about developing an 8-inch gun. And you don't have to, you know, really worry about capital ship assets because... It, well, you will probably end up building them because you're Nazi Germany and you're run by someone who has got a huge, huge problems with compensation for things. And that's what you're dealing with. But still, you could have dealt with it. And the problem that goes back to many of these ship programs and comes in with many of them is the sheer amount of interference in their designs. Because actually, this ship could have actually displaced less. And still been just as good, and still been just as capable of those same guns. It could have displaced less, but people keep adding in their ideas. And because of the... Okay. The polycratic sort of... I think I'm using the right poly word. Um, from memory nature of the German bureaucracy, where you have everyone is building up their own competing fiefdom, fiefdom of bureaucracy, and every fiefdom of bureaucracy has competing fiefdoms within that bureaucracy, within that fiefdom. So it's a whole feudalistic bureaucratic system where everyone's got to have an input into things, especially as you get onto Nazi Germany. It's bad enough under the Weimar Republic, but once you get onto Nazi Germany, it becomes just worse and worse and worse, it just keeps magnifying, growing and growing, and everyone's getting fiefdoms or fiefdoms or fiefdoms or fiefdoms, and everyone wants to have a bit in, and everyone wants to have a say, and people ask me how the hipper class ends up quite so inefficiently armed that they are basically the firepower of a county class cruiser in a tonnage which will which costs about three times that of a county class cruiser to build. And I go, well, it's because everyone had their own little unicorn that they wanted to attach to the Christmas tree. And that's it. Everyone had their own unicorn they wanted to attach to the Christmas tree. <laughs> okay. Mike Cavill, any idea why the Germans didn't use diesel engines to capital ships beside Lutzel and what's here in Graf's Bay? Because, honestly, they were being stupid. Because they wanted to build high-pressure boilers, because that's what the best navies had. And so they built these double-ended high-pressure boilers just to cause themselves nightmares, I think, of logistics and infrastructure and maintenance. I would like to know more about how the French ended up not trusting their own armed forces. Any good books on topic? Um, oh, I think it's the... Oh. Okay. Um, Rutledge has a book called The Third Republic in France, 1870 to 1940, and that's a good starting point. Um, it's called Conflicts and Continuities, and it's by William Fortescue, and it's a good starting point. It's not perfect, but it's a good starting point, Yankee yeah, 4472, if you want to learn more about that. Man. 
Manny Ashif, what would a 15,000 ton Panzer Chief look like if they had pushed their speed up to 30 knots? Would they have been more effective? They would have been more effective and it would have probably had 9, 11 inch guns in free triple turrets. I don't see them going for 12, but I do see 15,000 tons being probably slightly more armed and probably having a third um, shaft with another four diesel engines. I'm pretty sure they wanted to use diesels, but they weren't, uh, they weren't quite any quite powerful enough yet for the bigger ships. Yes and no. It depends on who you're talking to. As said, there is a certain element, and this is it comes through in the whole of the Hipper project and a few other sims, of when they are looking, uh, they are looking at what other people are doing, going, they are doing that, so we must do it better. Which means it must be shinier, more complicated, and more perfect. And you sit there and go, really, seriously. These things are absolute drains on your technology and resources. You have good diesel engines, build them. I think, I think the Nelsons would have been replaced before Hood. Oh, since refitted Hood is more useful to the world than the fast battleships uh, as compared to a Nelson, although that, they would be the last three to go. I think it would be a debate as to what went first. I think you might be right, but I wouldn't be surprised if it goes Nelson, Hood, Rodney, with Rodney lasting out last. Because Rodney is in the best position of all three, of those three. Hello, thanks. Uh, would you mind explaining why most Americans who are into naval history or just read a passage on Wikipedia tend to overestimate their fire control systems? Oh, good lord, that's an entire video. But basically, it comes down to the way fire control position uh, systems are often represented. Um, the uh, the great achievements of the American fire control systems by 1945 and how good they are then is presumed to be the same the whole way through World War Two, and it's not. But, also saying that, they were actually better than quite a few others. Mainly because they'd had some proper trial and dis uh, trial and development. For some reason, they'd been far, far more um, aggressive in testing their Mark 37 and other fire control systems than they had the Mark 14 torpedo. You can draw from that what you will. Christopher, I think Napoleon's rise to emperor overthrowing the First Republic and the military complicity in Napoleon III coming to power is part of the root of the distrust. Oh, it does have something to do with that. Uh, and thanks, you're right with that the Mark 37 general fire control system is really, really good system, even more so when combined radar. Yeah. Uh, you, you look. Now, what was the half-built Lutzar cruiser that Germans handed over to Soviets pre-1939 pact? There's a lot of confusion here, with some saying it was a Pog battleship that was handed over. No, it was a Hipper class that was handed over. Um, and then the Deutschland, the, the Deutschland class cruiser, the Deutschland, was renamed Lutzal because Hitler grew paranoid about ships named in Germany being sunk. Probably because one of the reasons this is often not, not realised is that one of the reasons the Graf Spey managed to sail around for as long as she is is because the British learned there are two Deutschland class out. There is the Graf Spey, which they think is somewhere in the South Atlantic, and there is the Deutschland herself, which is somewhere in the North Atlantic. Now, which do you think the Royal Navy, being the Royal Navy, wants to focus on hunting down first? The one named Germany, or the one named after an admiral who won the Battle of Coronel? Can we all guess which the Royal Navy was trying rapidly to hunt down, and which was withdrawn to Germany as quickly as it possibly could, and managed to get through with... A lot of luck on its side that the British missed it. Because the British came pretty close on a couple of occasions. And basically it's because it was avoiding conflict. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, pretty much, yes, the, the Brits were hunting down Deutschland. And she almost had, I think... I think the vessel she almost had a close and personal conversation with was actually one of the R-Class battleships. And if 
if the R-Class battleship had been slightly over, I think the story goes, and there's a debate about this because it's it's putting different ships logs together because neither actually ever sees each other. But if you can see, if it basically seems if they had been a couple of miles either direction, um, if they'd been a couple of miles that way or they'd been a couple of miles that way, then the odds are the Deutschland ends up having a run-in with an R-Class battleship. And then our entire idea of the R-Class battleships could be very different because there would be an R-Class battleship which won a stonking victory against Germany in the beginning of the war. Literally sinking Germany. Come on, that's going to be a propaganda win. Churchill announcing that to the House of Commons. We have sunk Germany! As First Sea Lord, it is my honour to inform this house... These esteemed members of Parliament, Lords, Ladies, Gentlemen, and People of the United Kingdom, that we have sunk Germany. You could hear the rafters now. It would be a speech which would be up there with, I have a dream for its sonorous effects. If less likely for its quality, uh, less likely for its upliftingness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I move the after turret and the superstructure a little further back, forward turret a little bit more forward, and slot a third to super far the first turret. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could do that. A little bit more option will probably have to be a little... In reality, it probably AO2 is right. A little bit would have to be added to the hull, but not as much as necessarily you think. Because, again, these ships are grossly inefficient in their utility of space. Mogoff's medic truck. Would four twin 11 inches it be any better? Um, yes. That would still that's four twin eleven inches is still better is better than two triples, but three triples is probably better than four twins. But ten of other polycracy polycratic. Um, it means many centers of power, and basically it means that you've got a system within departments building up competing, uh, people building up their competing domains of power, and competing power, uh, competing hierarchies. And sometimes you have both formal and informal hierarchies that work within those departments, which can affect their operation. Which is one reason why, um, totalitarian states, which often do employ polycratic power centers to try and make it less likely for people to try and achieve uh, to usurp the leaders tend to become grossly inefficient because you have so many different levels of competition going on it's not an absence of competition it's an over it's an over abundance of quite deadly composition where it's more of a race to make your opponents look bad rather than to necessarily do better than your opponents How much weight would have been saved by just giving them unified secondary batteries? <laughs> well, just think. You then would probably save on cumulative number of mounts. You would save on storage space and facilities. You would save on crew. You'd save on support of those crew. You'd save on directors. You'd save on ammunition hoists. And Cox, USN taught 692 class steam plant to machinist make trainees for 30 years after what I learned on one. 600 pounds steam. Odd, but reliable. Old, but reliable tech. True by that point. Interesting. Could it be said a Bismarck class was massively over engineered vis a vis our opponents, say KGB class, and if so, why? Um, mainly it's inefficiently engineered. They're not over engineered, they're inefficiently engineered. That's their problem. 
and I'll be getting into the whole inefficiency, but basically it comes down to the competing centers of power again. When in Cox, a ship named Journey beamed down by three lesser Brits, a propaganda disaster. Christopher, if oaths of loyalty are to a person position, there's no ambiguity of like swearing loyalty to a document that is interpreted wildly differently by different political parties. <whistles> it is helpful sometimes. Uh, William Cox, only thing more border, more humility would have been bordering and capturing her. Which potentially um, there was actually a tribal flotilla wandering around with that very idea going through their heads. They didn't manage to find her, but there is a certain idea in my mind that 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 the um, uh, it's the sixth tribal squad. Uh, it's a sixth flotilla, I think it is, in the in the home fleet. It's the fourth in the Mediterranean fleet. And they were the second tribal flotilla when they originally built. Um, we did have the idea of maybe boarding and capturing her. Now, wasn't there an, that instance when the R class ship was on the otherwise uh, uh, was on the otherwise of a convoy from the other side of the convoy from Deutschland? Yes, there was another case in that scenario where the Deutschland was going to attack a convoy, and then it realised on the other side of the convoy was a friendly R class battleship going. Wait there! I'm coming! I'm coming! I see you! I'm coming! I'm coming! Wait there! Wait there! You're an eleven inch cruiser! I can beat you! I am coming! I will come to you! Stay there a moment! And the Deutschen basically went, Um, that's a very enthusiastic ship. Uh, we thought they just had a cruiser escort. Yeah, that's not a cruiser. Okay, so, um, bye bye! <laughs> and of course, the R class went, Well, I'm staying with the convoy because that's my job. But, you know, annoying. I was going to have so much fun. I don't think the... Uh, by the way, the tribals were actually succeeding in, board, in boarding one of these things. Actually boarding a warship at sea would have been very interesting. The Altmark incident is interesting because it achieves. It actually works out. But, um... No, I think it, the, the more likely thing is it would have gone down in a wave of torpedoes. Just funk. In the case of the sunken Deutschland, the commendations all around T with the, with the king for the command crew. Uh, T with just for the command crew? I think the entire crew. I think the king would visit the ship and probably take something with them. Probably, t probably the king would take the princesses with him to visit the ship. Nice to Churchill probably announced in the House of Commons on the main that could have been avenged. Look up his speech from that day. Modern time, prize money, uh, prize, uh, prize money and bragging rights for life on free drinks. Yep. Touching four twins would allow a slimmer hull and higher speed. Depends if you want more speed or less vulnerable hull. Hmm. Adhub, isn't 311H triples a Shan horse? And given that sisters have the sisters, aren't they just big cruisers? Now, there you have an interesting thing, because they are battleships, but as the Germans use all their large capital ships, cruisers and above as surface raiders, you can argue they're all being used as various forms of cruisers. And, yep, 311H tri triples is a Shan horse. And, as I said before, they are... And I said at the beginning of this, they are the, my favourite of all the German designs. They're the most efficient and capable of all the, the German designs for their roles. And yet, they're also the ones which really shouldn't be there. Really, they should have been building a free 11-inch cr gun cruiser rather than trying to build a battleship with 11-inch guns. Because if you're trying to build a battleship with 11-inch guns, what you end up with is battleship-grade armour and 11-inch guns, which by this point are nowhere near what a battleship should be armed with. 
Um, Gogbe, hello, member for a month. Uh, would you say a Deutschland class Stale Mangum is better for a Commerce Raider or Rickalu Dunkirk one? Um, Rickalu Dunkirk. Definitely. Honestly, it's easier to do that. And that's the other thing they could have done. They could have been a more efficient design. They could have gone full Melrod if they wanted to. Some here, oh good lord, the tribals would definitely go full 18th century on Deutschland and probably demand prize money. Yep, they would. Well, they demand something. Aaron Cuddock. Mm. Uh, I too. I would personally have gone for an all forward layout because you can quickly fill something you're approaching, kill something you're approaching, and hope you can outrun or outturn anything you on your stern. Mm hmm. My Kevin, were the German 11 inch guns superior to heavy guns on other nations in any performance characteristics? Nope. Mm, compare with R240 mm Look, if you're comparing them with the capital ship guns, they are not really good with the, compared to the 15-inch 42s. They're not going to match up against the 14-inch ones. Um, they don't match really up against the 16-inch or any of those. Now, if you go to some of the French ones, 13.5-inch ones, no, still don't really match in with them. 12-inch guns, yeah, they can compare to, but the 12-inch guns, I, if we're going to call them heavier guns, they're sort of the cruiser guns. So basically, they compare well with cruiser guns and cruiser heavy guns, but that's it, not really with capital ship guns. So not the truly heavy guns of the period. I see the art class like a granddad of Deutschland being a fog teenager. Um, potentially, but that granddad is armed with a couple of shotguns and turns out to be Terminator in disguise, so he's more the grain Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger Term Terminator. Um, Ryan, Taylor, uh, Ryan Taylor, if Deutschland is captured intact, where is Belfast Mordor's museum? Since it's safe, so seems safe bet Germany's part today is a prize by Tower Bridge. No, I think I think if anything, Germany would be parked in Liverpool. Because that would be where they'd have brought her into, and Liverpool would never have given her up. Under any circumstances. She might have ended up recommissioned and used as a Royal Navy ship for the rest of the war, but Liverpool would demand she stay in Liverpool. It, depending on which port she brought got into on the Atlantic ports, it would either be Liverpool or Glasgow would demand her. And they would fight tooth and nail to keep her, and no one would take them out of there. Them out of there. Yes, would you say there is a theme of over-engineering, inefficient engineering that runs through the history of the Third Reich? Bismarck versus King George V, Panther versus T-84. There are all probably others. This is weird, almost modern half belief that superior technology overcomes mass. Yeah, there is that weird belief, mainly because that belief is sponsored by people who are German officers who are taking American officers mainly around after the Second World War to try and tell them how they held off the Soviets. And yes, um, mass, there is a certain quotient of, te of superior technology can make up for a certain loss of lack of mass, but not for an infinite lack of mass. You cannot, you're, you're not sort of dealing with 100 to 1 odds. Uh, it's a firepower odds rather than mass of number odds, but still those matter. And with the German over-engineering, inefficient engineering, Germans never believe in doing anything that'll do. Or good enough. Those phrases do not turn up in German engineering. It has to be perfect. And that's the problem. Because often that makes it very difficult to maintain.
Hello, Thomas van, uh, van der Veld. William Cox, Superior Technology. I want dirigible 6 tf 30s Hmm. Mark and Angus, I did a what if. <sighs> Sorry, um, let me see if I can undelete you. Because, in the nicest way, Roland Cash Nightbot seems to forget you. Roland Cash, you have been timed out by Nightbot. Um, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Sorry, Roland. Uh, I'm trying to un. Uh, is there another admin on to help me find deal with on Nightbot? <laughs> oh, de -de 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 -de. let me get activate Nightbot. Log in and deal with them. Hello. Log in with YouTube. The Nightbot. Hello. Nightbot, why do you not like Roland? <laughs> Nightbot doesn't like Roland. <laughs> oh. Okay. Da -da 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 Logs. Uh, da -da. Uh, didn't. Let's see the dashboard of commands and the uh, spam protection and da -da 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 -da. what were they getting for? Run and cash is timed out for five seconds because of spamming. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Which one was that? <laughs> uh, spam protection. Logs. Roland Cash. Now, um, but da -da 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 -da. I'm not sure. I, I I think I've managed to. I think Roland, you should be able to talk again. Hopefully. Sorry about that. All right. No, I'm not. So I did want to uh, what, what if with Lord Edward Lord Nelson as trans Oh yeah, this is the D-class heavy cruisers, and this is why I have no hope for the Germans in improving the Deutschlands. It's better. It is better. And certainly from an air defense perspective, it is better. If you look at the positioning of the sort of fore, aft, and center line guns, so that either way, at whatever angle you sort of have least two, if not three, AA guns which can concentrate on you, but, you know. Stop spamming symbols. Uh, options on the symbols. Right then. So, I think I have that sorted now, Roland. Oh. Right. Nine hundred. In the modern day, or at least World War Two, post World War Two, could an SAS adaptation be used in a boarding action effectively at sea or something cruiser size? 
Um, not really. It, let's be a, an SBS. It'll be SBS, not an SAS for starters. It'll be special boat service, not special air service, because as much as they're trained for many things, special air service are usually soldiers, not marines, and marines would know what the marines and sailors would know their way around the ship far better than soldiers would, especially once you get to fighting in the engineering spaces. Uh, but the major trouble is that when you're fighting an engineer and you're fighting through one of these ships, if you consider them, they have so many subdivisions. They're so, thanks to the um, the whole subdivision going on to try and prevent the run with watertight spaces and all these things going on and the various lockable doors, it's going to actually mean that you're a fighting room to room, basically urban warfare on steroids. It's a nightmare. So taking a ship, in the Age of Sail you can do it because once you take the deck you've taken the ship. Because you control both the engine, i.e. the sails, and the ability to get access to anywhere else in the world. But you would have to take pretty much everywhere on the ship simultaneously. You have to take main engineering, you have to take fire control, and you have to take the bridge to be able to control the whole ship simultaneously. So you're going to have to be very lucky to get aboard on those circumstances. Thanks for the science. Imagine a 30, uh, for a 34 knot nail rod to pair with the tribods. Daryl Hampton would not have made it, for, it would have made it far faster than 34 knots. Alpha, did the, the capture of Norway and thus away out North Sea increase uh, tra uh, sea traffic, increase the German cruiser ambitions? Yes, massively. <laughs> Mikey Newman, you said a nightbot, my old foe, and nightbot has immediately taken revenge on you for some reason. <laughs> I'm not sure why nightbot. <laughs> Okay, Dan Freeman, good luck fighting Nightbot. Nightbot appears to be winning the fight. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. This is going to be fun. Right. Um, if the Switcher was Catch-A-Commission, would she be HMS Sauerkraut? No, she'd be HMS Deutschland. This is, the Royal Navy would not change that name. They would be saying, but they would be, they'd probably make her a Task Force flagship. They would, that ship would be involved in D-Day. They would have it everywhere. They would be daring the Germans to sink Germany, just so they could put out the headline, Germany sinks Germany. They'd send it through the Mediterranean just to scare for the Italians and the Germans to go, Yeah, no, we can't do an air attack on that ship. That's Germany. We can't sink her. And I am, and the, the crew would be going, We are invulnerable. It just, yeah. Oh, Phantom, tell me about it. How to help out, out reverse engineer a German radar once. A Jagos type, and every component had a double function. Typical German electronics design, too, of World War II. Mm -hmm. My color, it seems like diesel power, uh, it seems like diesel powered light cruisers would have been a good solution. Mm, yeah. <sighs> Thanks. The clock. How do we fit a renowned fair against all three Deutschlands at the same time? Had it happened somewhere in the parallel universe? Um, refitted renowned versus all three Deutschlands? Uh, a. It can go a lot faster than them, so it would decide when it fought them. And B. It probably picks them off one at a time. It probably dashes in, fires off shells until it sunk one of them, and then moves out so that they can't form up to try and overwhelm it. And then waits again and dashes in again. And especially as it's got radar-controlled fire controls quite early on. Yeah, that would be a nighttime nightmare for the Germans.
I do love that Nightbot says things like, you're starting to bug me. Right, can I check something out, please? I read a story in this book, an interest of World War study sort of The story is that when the Soviets returned Rolla uh, Sovereign, it was, one, it was one, turrets were never turned since they gave to us up. Yep. Uh, two, there was extra in the officers' quarters. Yep. Uh, basically, they had nothing, they had no facilities to maintain the Royal Sovereign, so she f f almost fell apart. The crews that they'd had actually turned up quite well, because they had the facilities to maintain her. But the battleship was literally just sailed around and barely moved, because if you can't oil, if you can't do the maintenance for it, these things stop working. And then once they stop working, it's very difficult to get them back to fixing, which is why she's basically, in the end, is literally just falling apart. The Royal Navy basically takes her and goes, uh, decon, then destroy. <laughs> Sorry, I've been running. Uh, running isn't really destroyed. I'm falling over forwards. Slowly, uh, slowly, for my, what my treadmill tells me, is that it was three and a half kilometers. Well, that's okay. Now, tied up, Mike Newman, only for five seconds, because he was bug because he decided to bug him by literally saying to us, "A nightbot, my old foe." <laughs> 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 Basically, Mikey Newman challenged the bot. <laughs> Ryan Taylor, the bot is challenging the jewels. The jewels. I think so. <laughs> All right. I was considering renaming the bot something like HMS Eskimo, but, you know. There are so many spaces on a ship for people and the stuff to hide. It's a really difficult place to capture. Yes. Sounds funny. Also, in Age of Sail, it's a very bad place to counterattack an enemy-controlled deck with standard infantry tactical manual of the day. No concentration of force by possible massing personnel. Nope. <laughs> William Cox, I'm not going to repeat that, but yeah, that you're not the first time I've heard that, sorry. And fam, seizing the ship, uh, the ship, one wonders what the German for, look at me, I'm captain now is. Um, let's see. Shall make a ik bin jets de captain de kapitan. Or Schau mich an, ich bin jetzt der Kapitän. Schau mich an, ich bin jetzt der Kapitän. Hopefully YouTube doesn't mind me doing that one. If you told Captain Daryl Hamilton that he was getting hood and her engines were shot, he may would maybe have got want something done. He would have had her fixed. Just one wouldn't count out Hitler making Deutschland the priority, regain Germany's honor or some sort of honor. I know, quite possibly. But again, the British might turn that into an advantage as well. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, the patron suggestions for December will go live tomorrow. Sorry, they've been a little bit. 
and the vote will be have to be done by Sunday. So you basically you'll have from tomorrow till Sunday to vote for the patron for some uh, for December, mainly because things have just caught up with me this week. It's been a fun week. All right. So getting back to this, these are your light cruisers now. I mentioned that there was a slide earlier which had offset guns. If I remember correctly, it goes back to here. And the reason for the offset guns on the light cruisers was because in reality these vessels were mine layers. For want of a better phraseology and description, that is what their real purpose is. That's also one reason why the, mo the ARF guns do make sense, although frankly I find them personally quite disturbing. I would have said there's a far better route to go, and it would have been far more sensible, especially for their other roles, to have gone for a scenario where you had two guns forward, one gun after, aft, and therefore you could have, if you took away the y, if you took away the Y position, put that in a B position, you would then have the entire aft deck for mines, and you could have, well, as you see, you can see the torpedoes are here. So you'd have the entire aft deck for mines in a position in which you wouldn't have a gun turret in the middle of them. Which would allow you to also have all centre line, which is actually better for stability perspectives. <laughs> Ruin, I think the one thing worse than a trouble seizing a Deutschland is the Polish seizing a Deutschland. Well, that's the other thing. At a certain point, the Deutschland might be handed over to the Polish. Whatever you do, don't rename Nightbot HMS Warspite. Mmm. So tempting. Ah. <laughs> oh. So tempting. Mmm. If I find out how I can rename Nightbot, I will. Oh, Richards, you're a top chatter. Now, given Abfab, given cruisers and destroyers work best in packs, how come the Germans never really did that? Well, the Germans really never really had packs of destroyers or packs of cruisers because they didn't build enough. And this is part of the problem. Their early light like, the cruiser program is really about getting the mine layers, and hence you have the offset turrets of the aft, and hence you have everything really built around the mine laying capacity. And that gives them these rapid mine laying ships. But the trouble is for the Germans is their destroyer numbers and their light cruiser numbers get decimated early in the war. They have a lot of ships damaged, they have a lot of ships lost in Norway, and they never really recovered them. And that is one of the problems, again, if we go back to the whole Plan Z. You look at this force and you go, okay, so 90 torpedo boats and 68 destroyers, that's 158 vessels, right? Well, if you consider the 22 crow uh, scout cruisers as well, that takes you up to 180 of your 230 ships. So they are definitely three quarters, really, of your fleet. So that should be probably having three quarters of your effort, uh, effort in terms of ships being produced. And yet, whilst you have got more destroyers and more torpedo boats produced than you have any other group, mainly because, thankfully, they're so small that most people don't start getting involved and start mucking around with them, you really don't have enough actually having been produced. And enough available. The Germans haven't been emphasising them. Also, the Germans haven't got the yards to emphasise them. The Germans haven't got the yards to build them and build... their other ships. They haven't got the infrastructure. Plan Z is vaporware. And that is one of the problems with the cruisers. You have these three plans for their cruisers. You have the theoretical plan, which is 
this wonderful plan where you're going to have these distributed groups of surface raiders, all these task groups to back them up. It's going to be wonderful. It looks great on paper. Then you have the procurement plan, which is actually not enough ships to do that. And then you have the plan, which is uh, the ships actually procured and what you can do with them. What they end up doing is doing surface raiding with everything. No matter how small or how it should, much it shouldn't be doing that job. Sorry, I just read 16,000 tons was 2 quad 11 inches. Why would you want to make something with 2 quad 11 inches? Why would anyone want to do a quad turret unless they have to? Only person who willingly goes into creating a quad turret is someone called Chatfield. For 16,000 tons, you could make a Queen, you could make a Deutschland class with three treble 11 inch guns quite easily. Certainly we've been more capable. Mm-hmm. And I found out, I get Soviet Navy cru Soviet cruisers and Soviet Navy for Christmas, so I ain't complaining about for I'm complaining about the coming thirty to forty days. Enjoy. I think by the time the British might have taken over the Deutschland class, they would have been at war. So in which case, the treaty system no longer applies once one powers is at war. You then don't have to be limited by it. Would you agree that the Z class of destroyers are really short range small cruisers? I'd certainly agree that the Z class are aiming to be that, but they're really not good at it. Because it's going to sound strange, but the British cracked the destroyer cruiser role by going for a destroyer built to cruiser lines, and the Germans tried to build a cruiser built uh, uh, to build a cruiser to destroyer lines, and it doesn't work. I found out, well, they're not even, then they were not even, then we're not even talking about the tradition of those destroyers and small ships being lost escorting convoys through the Baltic North Sea. Basically, by 1944, there's nothing there functional. Nope. Jonah, no, no. good evening to see. How much of the French naval infrastructure outside of Vichy control could have been utilized to boost shipbuilding act? I assume they have access to French designs for repurpose. They did! But if you consider that it took them most of the few years to get one flower class corvette into service, shows you how reliable those French yards were at building them. Because just having the yards is enough, you need the personnel. And it's really difficult to force people to make stuff for you, which is complicated. Because you think about it. You want a welder to weld properly for you. It's very difficult to test the weld without doing x-rays and all sorts of things on it. Which you don't necessarily have access to in World War II. And certainly not on the scale needed to check out an entire ship. So, if you try and use force to make a welder do the, wel do the welding, when they want to, you could quite easily end up with a ship which will fall apart the moment it gets out to sea. And who do you blame? 
And by the way, if you do decide to blame and kill all the welders, well, that's great, but then you're not going to get any more ships built for you, are you? And this is the problem with using the Vichy French Yards. Sorry. Okay, let me go just give you advice for future reference. And this is going to sound like a long-running thing with me. But do not, whatever you do, get in a food fight with your younger cousins. You will end up somehow with getting apple crumble and custard in your ears. Leave it to one side. I posted never were pictures of conditions. I did it for completeness. Just so that they just look wrong. They do look wrong. They will look wrong. Without even looking at them, I can tell you they look wrong. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Let's, you know, see what we can do. Oof. Oh. Oh, I can set up managers. Oh. Regulars, logs, song requests. Wow. All these things, but yes. We will have a conversation with it and we will see if we can't change its name. Because really it should be called something different on my channel than Nightbot. Mm-hmm. But of course, the Sovereign and Submarine campaigns are completely forgotten nowadays. I guess sinking the iron ore convoys from Sweden all the way into tankers in the Baltic. There are lots of submarine campaigns in World War II which are forgotten. The Soviet ones, the British ones, the British Mediterranean campaign, the British campaign in, South e in the waters of Southeast Asia. They're all forgotten. Uh, it's like a lot of the war, a lot of World War II, and this is another thing to remember when talking about the German cruisers. Because it's very easy to bash them, because they don't achieve as much as you think they should achieve, but they do achieve an outside presence. It's one of the things you can get into when you start going on about turpits, and people going, well, you know, Pound was terrible to believe that PQ-17 could be attacked by turpits. Well, it wouldn't have been the first time the Germans had sorted with such a vessel in the High North. And that's the thing. The Germans do it on a regular basis with various other ships. It's a very real possibility. And the thing is, he's not supposed to risk the heavy cover. Because it's an Anglo-German one, an Anglo-American one, and he's got to keep him safe. So that's his problem. Jane, how's Iron Brew managed to restock the four closest candies to you, Dr. Glock? Yep. So, here we have the Hippoclass, and this is where you start to get something interesting, because, again, if we go back to Plan Z, this tells you all you need to know about them, really. They were planning on building five heavy cruisers. They'd ordered five Hippos. They'd built three. That was all the heavy cruisers they wanted. Why? Because at a certain point, a hippo is enough, theoretically, but not enough. You see, why did the Germans build an 8-inch cruiser? Because the British, the French, the Italians, everyone else has 8-inch cruisers. But why build an 8-inch cruiser when you can build an 11-inch cruiser? Well, you know, it's part of the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. Yeah, we have to be limited. This is the thing. The Anglo-German Naval Treaty is often critiqued. It's terrible. The British are giving the Germans this thing. The British don't even expect the Germans to keep to it. But what they do do successfully is they make the Germans build 8-inch cruisers, when 8-inch cruisers don't serve their needs at all.
Sorry. I think I've got it all out of my ear. I think now it's just psychologically, I think it's in, still in my ear. It's not, it's days ago, but I think it's just, I, I just think the stuff's still in there. I got revenge with a strawberry tartlet, but we'll leave that to one side. <laughs> Just wrong. Nazair did have U-boat pens, but even then, didn't they? Did not condone uh, conduct actual uh, conduct to actual production. Yeah. Complete off topic. But what happens if the machine spirit of war spite is given to a G three or an N three to play with? Um. G3, it's probably going for world domination. N3, it's probably just going to take over the Mediterranean. So, the HIPAA class. You might have noticed the Germans do have a certain design flair coming on their ships. They look... To an extent, pretty similar going through their designs. Look at their sort of their forward superstructure, uh, their forward superstructure, their shaping, their shaping in the funnels, etc. These ships are quite famous because they are all built with straight bows and then taken back in the yard and they have Atlantic bows fitted. They're all built with flat, straight funnels and then they have the caps fitted, which are angled etc. because basically you can't make these changes once they're on the shipyard because that will cause that will disrupt the various groups who are building the various components. But um yeah these ships these ships are a problem from the get go because where do they fit? They're another eight inch cruiser, which is great for the British because with eight eight inch guns they match in perfectly versus a county. Um, yeah, do they have thicker, better armor than a county? Mm, oh, depends on the angle. Uh, do they have... They displace a lot. They're going to be massively... Like, so, as well, just to confirm that Nightbot cannot be re renamed Rats. That is annoying. I'll have to work on it. I'm sure there's a way to, some, there's some way it can be done. Maybe a little light coding. Mm-hmm. Mm. I wonder if I can rename it. We'll see. But all these things, all these parts of them, add up to a ship which is the probably the epitome of designed by committee of committees. I mean, every part of it individually is well, very well thought through. And there are lots of things you can point to there and you can go, well, there's a very well thought through turret, so there's a very well thought through this, there's a very well thought through that. But as an aggregate, the whole thing is a case of, oh. Oh. Uh, the design look was how what that was that on purpose. E.g., Eugene looked like Bismarck and thus confuse Hood and Prince of Wales. Yes and no to an extent. There is certainly an argument you can make for that, but there again, to an extent, all county cruisers, especially uh, all eight-inch cruisers and county, oh, sort of whether the county class, whatever they are, do start to look like, especially when they're twin turrets forward and twin turrets aft start to look like capital ships, because that's how the capital ships are laid out. And it's the same with the tribal class destroyers, etc. They all have a similar thing going on. But, he says this, but, it doesn't necessarily confuse the targets of range, it's just something which is an advantage if people, if things look like certain other things. Around it said it seems like one of the German dom and German's dumbest decision equipment decisions. Ninety-five percent complete, and they go now. Nah, we want something else instead of this. 
Uh, it's very true. It's 95% complete, and then they decided they want to build it into an aircraft carrier instead of a cruiser. C-Clark, the diesel ships were quite fuel efficient. How fuel efficient were the HIPAA class? Not as fuel efficient as they would like to be, by a long shot. And honestly, it gets worse when you consider that their engines are maintenance freaks. It's one of the things the Americans do notice in their reports post Second World War. The German and uh, the German systems are very good, but the German systems are also incredibly I intensive maintenance, and the double end boilers are probably the most so on the Jürgen. Uh, Hipper and Blucher's engines were built by Blom and Voss. Uh, Jürgen's turbines were built by the German left. And said that the Lutzal's engines were built and manufactured by Deschmark. All had 12 ultra high pressure boilers. Um, Sailors and Lutzal's were nine double ended boilers. And. Uh, the first three ships had 12 ultra-high pressure boilers. Sailors and Lutzel were equipped with nine double-ended boilers. Um, Hippers and Eugen's boilers were manufactured by Wagner. And the rest were all built by Le Mans. Now, here is the end of an interesting thing. Originally, Sailors and I think... I think originally Sailors and Lutzel were actually planned to be four triple six inch gun ships that doesn't make them any better because then you're basically going right then we're going to build something which has the firepower of a town class but it's going to display 16,000 tons and remember 16,000 170 tons is their designed weight. Their actual full load is 18 and a half thousand tons. So think about it from perspective. Yes, that's eight, that's 18 and a half thousand tons. A full up displacement of a Southampton class is 11,000 tons. So you could build one and three quarters of the Southamptons roughly. Let's say they're 12,000 versus 18,000, so yeah. You can build one and a half Southamptons. So for every two of these, you could build three Southamptons for the same amount of tonnage and equipment. That's, especially when you consider the British Yards were more efficient anyway because they had a larger throughput and a larger design and a pool of labor to draw from. This has an impact. This has an impact on what you're building. Calvin Gasberg. If memory serves, some parts of the high-pressure German steam engines weren't made from the allies of designers wanted, were they? Um, no, they weren't. I suspect mechanical failure was to blame for Eugen's catastrophic engine failure. There are many issues going on there. I don't know about that. They did mobilise a lot of the repair facilities for the jet U-boats here in Belgium. They even built inland wharfs along the channels. Mm-hmm. But again, repair crews are not like manufacture crews. And you can bring in, again, because the repair crews tend to be smaller in size and fewer in number, you can bring in some of your own people from Germany to watch them.
Mark Hamlet, as a child I could forget vaguely what a Deutschland was supposed to be for. Why Bismarck, why Sean asked. My child's mind never got the hipper. They seem to be because navies are supposed to have cruisers, heavy cruisers. I, that's definitely a good case to make. I would also add, to an extent, it's because that is the Anglo-German Naval Treaty. The British did the same thing with a treaty as the Washington Treaty did to them. They did the same thing to the Germans. The moment you put in a treaty, you force someone to build to those standards. It's only when the Germans go, hang on, this treaty is so not working for us, and they're told by Hitler, yeah, throw away the treaty, I don't care about it. It's only built, to, I only got it to buy us time. And they go for it, and it works for them. At 16,000 tons, the Iron would have counties with tri all triple 8-inch turrets, fully armed belts, and even torpedo protection. At 16,000 tons, there'd be 12 9.2-inch guns probably there, sitting there going, Hello? Because that's an extra... Well, that's enough. That's a designed weight. Again, 18,500 tons full displacement. So... Yeah, that's a, a a big thing for the uh, for the Royal Navy or the German American Navy. But the thing is, if that's depends when they're building them, <laughs> you know, if you had, if for some reason the treaty had, the, let's say, the original Washington Treaty, and it has to be the original Washington Treaty, included a provision, had sort of things of 10,000 tons and cheese ships are considered light cruisers or below, are allowed guns up to 8 inches. Then they had 20,000 tons. These ships are allowed guns up to 12 inches, and these are your heavy cruisers or armor cruisers, whatever you want to call them. Then your carriers are allowed up to 30,000 tons, and your capital ships are allowed up to 40,000 tons and 16 inch guns. Yeah. It would work. set it up that the British and Americans are allowed 20, 10, uh, 20, 10 and 20 of each of the top three categories. And everyone's allowed their categories in relation, uh, in ratio to that. Take care, Amelia. So this is the Colne. And again, you can see what I mean about the offset system being there to provide space for mine sweeping gear, etc., uh, for mine laying gear and all these things. And again, you sit there and go, well, that allows you to put the engines forward. It allows you to be very efficient in that regard. But you could probably count the engines back a bit further, remove the lovely Y turret, maybe even plate over the entire after deck after X and sort of raise it up a deck level so you've got an entire covered mine laying area on that deck and that entire space devoted to mine laying and so you've got two torpedo launchers each side, good, but you know you'd have mines entirely ar around uh, and after that and you have the two guns forward. It'd work. They didn't. Because why? Well, if you consider a, li a light cruiser, that would have made it a better light cruiser, but possibly would have affected its ability as a mine layer and might have made you have to think more about its weight distribution and, its and the various forming other systems. Instead of that, then you might question the fact that you are basically building something which is designed to run away after dropping mines. That's it.
there are many interesting things about the design process. There's an interesting discussion going on about the efficiency and the ore turkey, but all turkey in personal electronic sources. But pretty much that was because the Germans were worried that, uh, like in World War One, they would be blocked off from everything. Remember, their entire plan for war in Britain had been that they supplied the fuses and the best fuses in the world for the British to use on their battleships. And all British shells up until quite late have German fuses. And some of the problems for the British at Jutland are the British fuses. And that is the real problem. Our entire, the ideal seemed far, far better mine layers than the German clay glass. The advantage the British have in that is the, Germ is the Germans are trying to seek a balance between being a mine layer and a light cruiser. And are really failing at both. And the Abdeels are a mine layer and the British have the towns, our refusers and Leanders as their light cruisers. And it's a case of, yeah, that's for that. It's really armed with anti-aircraft capabilities because those are the only things which can really catch it. And so this leads us to the Battle of the Denmark Straits. Now, why is this interesting? Because, yes, this is the task force going out. This is something which the Germans had planned on. The Germans had planned on sending task forces out to sea. But let's consider that task force. The planned task force had been an aircraft carrier, a couple of battleships, and a few cruisers. This force is a single battleship and a single cruiser. And the Germans had considered delaying. They had considered delaying it till Tirpitz was maybe maybe ready, or until Scharnhorst or Neisenau was ready, until other cruisers were ready. It's got Prince Jürgen out there. This is the Germans realised this is a very small force to send. It's a very small force. They get very lucky at the Battle of Denmark Straits. Because on paper, a battle cruiser and a battleship versus a battleship and a cruiser should only end one way. On paper. Lance, sorry for being late party, before being explained, but what other reason why the fourth turret is off centre? Um, if we're going back this one, it's the third turret is off centre on these ones. Um, Hippers, they're all centre lined. Yeah, it's the third turret which is off centre, and the reason is um, to do with them, their capacity, their role as mine laying, and those sort of things. Seems like, Alex, what were design issues with light cruisers were trained on flex so badly rough over? Basically, they were, some of them were designed under the rule of which the Treaty of size, where they weren't supposed to be more than 6,000 tons. And even once they get past that, they are still very lightly built, and they are designed basically for Baltic operations, not for North Atlantic operations, especially not operations off the coast of Norway. So they're not designed for seas that big. And with the level of bracing and the keels and the strength of structural strength that you need to deal with that level of C. So basically, yeah, the Ryan Taylor, they're just, they're just too lightly built. It's also a case of their weight is not quite balanced. It's one of the things, when you build something which is supposed to be a perfect design, everything's often finely balanced, and then you're actually storing equipment or using up fuel and this and that, and suddenly, fine balance doesn't isn't there. Um, our own talent. I highly recommend it. I had so many notes of what, where the brains broken, couldn't understand their arguments. 
I think that's the wage of destruction, um, which you're talking about, which is the German economic policy book. It's a very good book. And it, let's put it this way, I, I have an interesting debate because there are some far more famous academics than me on YouTube and far more famous academics in the world on YouTube who will get into Hitler and his foreign policy. But so far this week I have been talking a lot about Stalin and a lot about Hitler who are not my most favourite people in the world to talk about. And... I... would often tell people that people can... Uh, one of the things you have to remember about humans and personalities is people are very good at believing their own, delu their own delusions. Their own imaginations when it comes to things. And that's really a problem, I think. In the case of Hitler, especially, I think he believes his own imaginings. I'm not sure it's a sen It's definitely not a sensible thing to believe. It's not the right thing to believe, but he believes it. He believes that he is right. He believes that he know what he believes. What he knows to be true is true. The world doesn't work that way. And I think it's sort of to an extent the same with the Kaiser Wilhelm. They have their own beliefs. And you can't really do anything about it. Ooh. Mm-hmm. If they sent a larger force out of Bismarck, wouldn't they have just lost more ships, or would they have rapidly split up to make for many ships to drag down? Well, it depends on your perspective, but what it would do is probably to require the Brit If the Germans are sending out a larger force, how do the British respond? If the Germans have brought more ships, then the British are going to have to form larger groups. So what you probably end up doing is you end up with the King George V, uh, Prince of Wales and Hood and Victorious forming one task group together. In which case, where are they going to position themselves? How are they going to organise themselves? You also have the British going to have to call in more ships. That is what you'd have going on. You probably have county class called in, you have town class, you'd have every single cruiser, destroyer, everything they could get would be called into that group. So yes, it would be a bigger battle, but that would also be a bigger battle which would have to be brought about. The Germans would have to be found, they'd have to be they'd have to move in and engage each other. It would be a full on battle. That's going to actually require a lot more resources from the British, which is going to mean the British are going to be weaker elsewhere. Think about all the convoy escorts, which are going to lose their destroyers and lose the, uh, some of the other assets which normally protect them, because they're off with this fleet, being, uh, these fleets having to manoeuvre. Because the British would have to have more than one to cover the ocean, because if they only had one, they'd constantly be playing chase. They need to have two in order to try and box the Germans in. At least, probably three. So, the larger the Germans do notice, the larger the force they send, the more trouble the, these problems become exponentially more difficult for the British. And they do have always the option of dividing up the force and spreading out. Theoretically, if they'd waited and really put the effort into it, they could have had the um, Graf Zeppelin out with them, in which case you could have had a carrier battle in the Atlantic between Victorious and the Graf Zeppelin, and let's be honest, or maybe the Ark Royal and the Graf Zeppelin. Which would be an interesting thing, because if you end up with a carrier battle taking place in the Atlantic in 1941, before the War in the Pacific begins, you might end up with a slightly different narrative on history.
Then I've got, the problem with the Bismarck type raiders is the need to reposition the support ships right where the Allies will look for them. That's why they didn't really have many support any support ships out for the Bismarck. There's several good YouTube channels on National Socialism and a fresh air flowing regarding the sheer economic delusions on which it was based. I'm glad we got these people, including yourself, Doctor. I, I, I Let's put it this way. Um, I, am, I, have been, I have discussed this with people a few times, and I'm instinctively distrustful of any government which involves making decisions based on ideology. Doesn't matter which side the ideology comes from, I don't trust it. Uh, I think ideology can serve a good thing in coming of ideas for solution for problems, and I, a solution as I, and the solutions and coming of the ideas, but I think the actual solution which is implemented has to be made without a reference to ideology. It has to be made on the facts of which of the proposed solutions put forward by the ideologies is actually the best fit for the scenario you have. And I don't like any government which is making decisions based on ideology. Doesn't matter which side it comes from. So, yeah, not to mention the collective memory has been completely based on propaganda, like the German economic miracle, 1930s, it never happened. That's one of the other problems. The amount of people who turn around to me and tell me that Germany was economically stronger than Britain in 1939, 1945, uh, 1939, and I sit there and look at them and go, Really? Well, one of those countries goes bankrupt during World War II, and the other one doesn't. And it keeps going. Yes, it's, go it's taking a lot of loans. And yes, there's Lend-Lease and those things going on, but to be honest, the British economy is fighting a far wider effort and far more mobilised for war, and it keeps going. Now, this, of course, is what happens when you decide that, frankly, whilst it's better to have your ship things offset to provide you more space for mines... You don't want them that offset, so you want to build something better. So this is what the Nuremberg and Leipzig are. But as again, still, you are talking about all these six-inch guns being our facing. So it's got more firepower aft. Dr. C, how do you make it for academia? Ideology is life order. Violate it and people go crazy. Hey, look. I'm a contract lecturer. Haven't managed to make it get a tenured post, have I? But also, it's not that bad. In my experience, there are a lot more academics who are like me than there are academics who aren't. It doesn't matter which side their political leanings are. Most of them are actually quite thoughtful people who prefer to actually deal with solutions than ideologies. Take care, Wayne's World of Science, uh, Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Ooh, speaking of new stuff, I've got a more RAM for my la and my computer, so that should make it better. And hopefully should be allow me to do Twitch broadcasts on Sunday when I'm doing brew ships as well as YouTube broadcasts. I, mean, I know most people are moving away from Twitch, but I thought I'd give it a go as well because I know there are some people who don't like using YouTube. So that's something coming up. I'm probably possibly going to do that, or a or do Facebook at the same time as a broadcast. Still deciding which two. Alpha British economy is the British Empire economy, with huge areas of that effectively not adversely affected by the war. Yes, and that is the other problem because if you consider the sheer amount of money which Canada's prepared to put into fighting the war, and India doesn't really have any choice in putting in, and South Africa similarly not much choice. Mm -hmm. So Nuremberg's are better, but again, they're still the wrong way round. And why are they the wrong way round? Because what do you want to do with this ship? Now, I know in World of Warships, you can have great fun with these ships. I know I have played with them. And they are great in a World of Warship scenario, when you're doing the stats and you're engaging those sort of short range. 
Well, when you're engaging at long range, and when you actually have humans rather than computer logarithms helping you, um, well, it works. But when you're actually in the sea fights and actually looking at them in terms of the actual real life naval engagements, they run into problems quite quite consistently because of their layout and because of the way the hull is weighted. And this is the big problem with Germans. If you can go back to their cruiser policy, and this is the whole thing about this cruiser policy and heavy cruisers, light cruisers. So let's say you build a light cruiser based on the Hippoclast. That's great, you have now got a light cruiser. But how much help is that really? Because what do you need your light cruisers to do? What are you building your light cruisers for? Your scout cruisers and light cruisers theoretically are being built as escorts for your battleships, battle cruisers and aircraft carriers when they go out to sea as part of these large task groups. Panzer Sheep are the surface raiders. Heavy cruisers will be making up the numbers, I presume, of any task group. But let's be honest, there's only five of them. You're planning on having ten battleships? Three battle cruisers? Now, as new IQB 442, I always thought that dealing with the one forward, two after was to be dealing with being chased by an enemy. This is true and is a factor when you're thinking about being a mine layer. But again, then you have to decide, are you building a mine layer or a light cruiser? And if you're building a mine layer, why are you sticking a load of six inch guns in the middle of your mine laying this area? I know that the French have some interesting things going on with their mine laying, but this doesn't really make much sense. But 11 inch guns are really cool. And this gets us back to this point of the 11 inch guns. Because the Germans... It's one of those strange things. The Deutschland class I find absurd in so many ways because designing as they do, they guarantee we're either going to be facing a pack of British cruisers or a capital ship. And people go, well, you know, they were designed to feel the French. Well, then you were going to be dealing with a French pack of cruisers or a capital ship. And where do the French have most of their merchant trade going? Well, most of their merchant trade is going across the Mediterranean, which means you have to get into the Mediterranean. That's not good. This is before your alliance with, with Italy, remember? Or you are talking about their French global trade. Well, again... Their trade from their Far Eastern Empire has to cross the Indian Ocean and go into through the Suez Canal, which will be guarded by the British. The British will not agree with you going into the Suez Canal and probably designate the Red Sea area, the Red Sea off the off limits as well, because the British will go, nope. We don't want any kind of firing or fighting interfering with our own shipping, and the Red Sea is too narrow for the fighting to be going on, so it's now neutral, and by the way, we have a Queen Elizabeth-class battleship sitting there, and a flotilla of tribal destroyers, and a town-class cruiser, and a county-class cruiser. Have we made our point? We have. Good to know. And that's pretty much what you get. Maybe it'd be an R-class rather than a Queen Elizabeth-class. And the rest of the uh, the French merchant marine, well, what they could do is just rebrand themselves as British, in which case, uh, that's not a good time for you guys to go hunting them down. But saying that, the 11-inch guns then form, of course, a resource thing. They are actually perfect for causing your enemy to have to have resource issues, because they have to build both packs of cruisers and capital ships. You want to stretch your opponent's resources out, you build these ships, and you build them with 9 11-inch guns, as I said. You build cruisers with 9 11-inch guns, not battleships with 9 11-inch guns, because that's 
a waste of a battleship hull in some regards. And you have the capabilities. But you build them with six, and suddenly it's a case of, oh. Well, I don't need to worry about building new capital ships to deal with that. I've got things which are fast enough to deal with those. That's what the R-Class and Hood are for. If you're Britain. And on the other side of the equation, yeah, they've only got six guns. So what's the size of cat? And what's the size of bat uh, cruiser force I need to engage them? Well, what's ideal pack size? It's going to be three or four cruisers. Why? Because they've only got two sets of two turrets. So the maximum they can engage theoretically is two targets with their primary gu guns at any one time. And whilst, yes, they've got very good secondaries, mm, that's not really what you want, especially not laid out as they are, what you want to be dealing with. with. You know, it's just not the sensible thing. And yes, the Deutschland secondaries are 6-inch guns. They're 150 millimeters. So they're, they're 5.9 inch, but near enough makes no difference. Six inch, considering 6 inches is 152 millimeters or uh, as a rule we consider it so in a nicest way call it it's saying suddenly that 150 which is difference of two millimeters is 5.9 inches when a inch is 25.4 millimeters yeah difference of two millimeters okay so they're pretty much six inch guns. They're good secondaries, but again, if I was designing this, and if we go back to this design of the Deutschlands, well, here you've got them done this way with four turrets. But really, what would have been sensible is if you really want to just stick with only having six 11 inch turrets. You stick one of the six inch turrets in the B position, one in an X position above this. Then you stick them as two sides. Then you use the the uh, 88 millimeters as your corner weapons, and you therefore have a broadside of nine six inch guns. So what it then becomes is a light cruiser with extra 11 inch guns. It's got a broadside of six uh, six inch guns and nine eleven inch guns, and therefore your uh, nine six inch guns and six nine uh, six eleven inch guns, and therefore you can basically go target will be engaged by this this and this. Now, admittedly, these are twin turrets; they are twin six inch turrets. And then, if we go back to this, well, they are single guns. And again, you're building a triple turret for eleven inch guns. Are you honestly telling me it's beyond your wit to build a triple turret for 6-inch guns? If you really don't want to fit that elusive extra 6-inch gun, uh, those elusive, you know, the, the third 11-inch turret because you don't want to look like you're breaking the treaty, then, as said, four, six, uh, four triple 6-inch six turrets will do. And they will, basically, then you become a light cruiser with 11-inch guns attached. Useful. Because the 11 inch guns are what give these ships their capability. And if you're building a fleet of service raiders around service raiding, okay, the 11 inch guns mean that you're going to require heavy cruisers and you're going to require capital ships to engage them. So they raise the cost of building them. And then you can just churn these ships out. That would be a sound strategy. Maybe build an aircraft carrier. Honestly, I'm not sure the Graf Zeppelin would ever be any help to anyone. But building actually a consistent policy would have been sensible. But at no point do the Germans sit down and do a consistent policy or do something like that. They're constantly looking to build to match and exceed others in status. Someone made the point about this, this is like the Nuremberg rallies. It is. It's an ego trip. It's a status trip. It's about who has the biggest swinging 16-inch gun.
Ah, two. Designed to deal with the French. Probably just means the Algeri is going to chew them up and spit them out. At least for the hippos. The Algeri would do nasty things to a hippo. You know, it could be forced to do. In a hypothetical Germany versus France alone, would Britain even allow Germany past hit uh, Gibraltar? No, I have a feeling HMS Nelson or HMS Rodney would have been parked in Gibraltar Harbour and it would have been a case of. So you are trying to get past us? No, good, go by. Vision. In a UAD, a G in UAD, that's Ultimate Animal Dreadnoughts, a German heavy cruiser with three triple 11 inch turrets dies well against packs of RN cruisers, but Hood trumps it with 15 inch guns. Grass Zeppelin circles slowly, sad. <laughs> circles slowly, sad. Yep. Alex, uh, 17 o'clock. Alex, what would a, mess a sensible German six inch cruiser for raiding be then? <sighs> Well, the Germans had a plan for a... Uh, oh, not that. Not this design. Under no circumstances, that design. These, the M-Class, um, were theoretically their counters to the towns, but let's be honest, they have eight six-inch guns, so a town-class cruiser would probably consider them dinner. They are supposed to have better armour and better things than the town-class, but... I honestly, whenever I've looked at them, I've gone, a town class will consider you dinner. You're the German equivalent of a town class. You will be dinner. HMS Glasgow will be eating you alive. <sighs> but on, uh, for surface rating... Okay, if I was going for a surface rating 6-inch vessel... I'd want speed and I'd want range. I'd want to at least be able to achieve 30 knots and I'd want the range you need, you need for them. And that's part of the, the problem for the Germans. The H-class battleship is it seems to be obsessed with range. There's one stat out there that it could do sort of roughly 20,000 nautical miles, which is fun. Um, but what would be sensible? If you don't consider this the town class killer or equivalent, which probably works. The M class probably works as a six inch surface radar. Probably works. This works as a fast mine layer. Oh, good lord. Why are people discussing UFOs in the chat? Just clarify, seeking clarification. So, let's consider these. These are the scout cruisers. Now, I and please note, Horatio fails. Great, does the great designs. They're on Wikipedia. And that's where I've got the images for from, and I would, honestly, I, I, I hope to find out, I, well, I found out their name, but I haven't got their contact details, because if I end up uh, doing these books I'm doing for Kindle, etc., at some point I'm going to want someone to illustrate, do some ship it design illustrations for me, and they seem to have a very nice li idea of lines, far better than I do. And... As I've said in one of the videos I recorded recently, although I'm not so, I don't think it's come out yet. I have things that I sort of, if I'm going to put it in a book, etc., and be taking money for that book, I don't want someone to do it for free. I want to pay someone for it because it seems fair to me, especially as I know that's what the publishers, etc., do. And if I ask, for, if I do a sort of general thing of, I'd like designs, please, if people would happen to draw them, I know none of you will ask me for money. Because you're all far too nice and generous. So, yeah. Anyway. 
These designs were supposed to be able to do 36 knots thanks to um, two man six cylinder diesel engines. Big ones. A range of 7,000 nautical miles at 17 knots. Complement 200. Armed with six 5.9 inch guns. Okay. Two twin 88 millimeter guns, I'd reckon. Uh, eight 37 millimeter guns. Eight 20 millimeter guns. And uh, 10 21 inch torpedo tubes. All those who think that their one inch of belt armor and one inch of deck armor would just mean as far as a, as far as a tribal class of straw would go, these would be lunch. Um, please say A. Especially as if the Germans had built them, they would have been, I'm sure, if they built them in enough numbers, they could have been very good. But I'm fairly sure if they built them enough numbers, then the British would have built more heavy destroyers. And it would have been a case of, hello, have you met the tribal class, the battle class, and our friends, the Darings? Hello, please meet our Lord and Saviour, the 4.5 inch gun. No, no, serious. It's an internal joke for people who've seen a video regarding Hitler being a British agent. <laughs> oh, good lord. That's giving the British intelligence services far too much capability. Yes, we're often really not really friendly to our graphs. Yeah. Poor CV, you are. Uh, you want a cookie donated by our graphs or fish, uh, fish maybe? Uh, Dan Truman. So, Germany doesn't have a cruiser policy. They have a free 11 inch armed panzer chief for raiding. Two task group supporting cruisers, free ignorant dictator, e dictator Egypt, Egypt, e ego project. Uh, pretty much. Hello, Furrican. Well, I am late. Something to catch up to the tune of four cheese and ham toasties. Enjoy. Blumkopf, replace Deutschland's R torpedo tubes with launch rails for the MY, MXY9 Mod 22 with 22 km range and turbojet sustainer motors. Recruit a core of veteran or ace uh, Subzel uh, Kamikaze pilots. MXY7, sorry. Why, in the name of all things holy, would you want to put that construction on the back of your ship? Because A, you spot the enemy at 22 km range, that's great, but. How are you going to get enough accuracy to guide it in at, with those systems and the way to run out? And B, there is going to be an aircraft carrier somewhere outside of 22 kilometers range which is going to go, Oh, your tail is a giant floating bomb with all that rocket fuel on it. Oh, fun. Dan Tune, one inch belt armor, just not to start the fuses on the bombs. Shells, yep. Yes, these are the things which would have made the Dido class actually go, oh. So, um, you just want me to plaster an entire fleet with 5.25 inch shells. Just one, 4.5 inch gun? That's the dirty I could get behind. Cody 85. Uh, Spec Cruiser. Looks like it needs a triple 128mm dual purpose guns. It needs so many things. It needs so many, many things. It has the basis of being quite an intelligent and interesting design. The first three ships were ordered in February 1941, designated SB-1, 2, and 3, formerly named Z-40, Z-41, and Z-42. In December 1941, 
the three engines, SP4, 5 and 6 were ordered, but not the ships. And SP1 is the only ship for which the keel is laid down and actual construction starts. But during an air raid in April 1942, the ship plans were destroyed and construction was halted. The metal was scrapped and used to build submarines and regular destroyers that were already further along their build programs. Here is the thing, and please don't take this as wrong, but um... Can you imagine? And that's what it is. The British have many yards which get hit by bombs and fires, etc. during World War II. There are even some during World War I. Can you imagine the reaction of the Admiralty if they learnt that a ship was stopped because the only set of plans that existed were learned, uh, blown up? And it doesn't really sound credible with the Germans either. So there must have been more copies of the designs going around. Unless the Germans are even more stupid and inefficient than we thought about in their bureaucratic practices. I.e. someone was so power hungry and so wanting to control the construction of these ships that their only people who had the copy of the designs was that particular fiefdom. If that is the case... It's not surprising, but it's worse than oh, even I presumed. And you sit there and go, um, mm. you stopped building the ship, not because the ship was hit in the shipyard, not because you didn't want not want the ship, but because you've lost the designs for the ship. Oh. That's what would it have needed a stronger keel? Or was it one of the designs that would have struggled with waves in North Sea, let alone North Atlantic? Oh, it would have had fun. But it was being built slightly firmer than the other ships had been built. See, so I look at us, where is the point in the one inch armor? It's nice to have some armor. So, here are the Sharnhorse. And they are, of course, battleships. They are battleships. They are battleships designed with guns which would have made, and a gun armament which made them kings in World War I. Let's be honest, nine 11 inch guns in this arrangement in World War I would have been an absolutely lethal, lethal concoction for the Germans to come out with. It would have been able to take on every 12 inch gun ship the Royal Navy could produce. But the trouble is, and this is one of the problems for the Royal Navy when it comes to getting the government behind rearmament and really surging defence spending, and this is one of the things, definite problems when it leads to the King George V's, is 11 inch guns, they are capable, but then you go, and what do the standard Royal Navy ships have? 15 inch. What do the latest Royal Navy ships have? 16 inch. What do the German ships have? 11 inch. What do our cruisers have? 8 inch. So there is 7 inches between a cruiser and a the nearest battleship. Yes. What's the halfway point on that? 11 and a half inches. Okay. So when they're building the 14 inch cruiser well, a 14-inch capital ship, then the 11 inch is sitting halfway exactly between the British cruisers and the British capital ships. It's just... It's really hard to motivate. When you're looking at this and trying to persuade the people that it's a threat. There's also, this is the entire reason why some people go, well, there must be battle cruisers because they're so underarmed. No, these are the biggest guns the Germans could build at the time. Okay? Biggest guns. They didn't have anything bigger they could fit in, and they were building Deutschland class, so they were already building something which was going to have 
11 inch guns, so they were already building those turrets and building those guns, and Hitler wanted a battleship. That is literally the entire reasoning behind the Scharnhorst, is they basically go gone for a stretch Deutschland class, which is built as a battleship. Tim McCarmichael, um, arrow two. If somehow there was only one set of blueprints, that person would have been up put up against the wall. I think it's probably just an excuse. See the clock, Alex. Reich Marshal Goring is in charge of arms procurement. Do you think do you need to figure that out about any other other answers? Goring is bombastic. He is many many things. But actually, even he isn't dense enough to really, uh, unless someone uh, to let, let someone get away with just one design. And remember, at this point, there's also there's Spear also running around in charge, in charge of different programs, and the Navy's constantly debating whether or not to join Spear's program or Goring's. Again, the polycratic nature of the, uh, the polycratic competition, uh, competitive nature of the German government and the German bureaucracy is going on. That's good. Given what was going on in other areas of German industry, well, that doesn't sound too far from what I can easily imagine going on. Oh, yeah. Neo Cooper for the Germans had the same thing happen with formula for aircraft grey wood glue. One factory gets hit and the formula burns. Dan Freeman, I know KFC and I think Big Mac's also kept the secrets, but I sincerely hope the formula for Ambrose is safety spread in many places. I believe it's held in free, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. William Cox, the formula for Coca-Cola is locked in a vault. I heard it was locked in multiple vaults, but yes. And Greek fire might be about to return. Thrak is working hard on that one. Kind of, Shannon's 11 inch guns are a tad more powerful than Panzer Chief's 11 inch, but still, honestly, it's they're a tad more powerful, but that's mainly because of modifications and the fact that they were designed for the D class to be more powerful. So, it's not a case of they are more powerful than the Panzer Chief because they are designed for a battleship, they're they upgraded ones which were intended for the next generation of Panzer Chief. As I see, just imagine Bismarck with 12 or even 15 11 inch guns and triple turrets. Uh, certainly would be the German attempt at the machine gun battleship, which was of course what the the British were attempting because their original aim was 12, 12 14 inch guns on a um, King George V. Thomas Arnold, working towards the Fodra, as they called it, with the whole Braganomic policy to Third Reich. Yep. Hello, Melanie. Oh, you've just finished shopping for glasses. I hope they're good and hope they're comfortable for you. Enjoy the restaurants. That's good. How much of a culture of Vranio existed in Joan Arlen's industry in the 30s and 40s? Colossal. The entire thing is Braganomics. The entire thing in the Soviet Navy is Braganomics. It's all Braganomics. Um, I'm having fun with that one, I have to admit. Oh, God, German Arms Engine, check out the Bofors connection. Yeah, there is the fact that, that what happens with a lot of the Germans' industry is they do a lot of claiming it and then they import it from the Swedes. The solutions from the Swedes. 
Our Swedes, the Bofors, are happy to take the money from both them and the British. Basically, Sweden has a ver is a very equal opportunities policy, but that's very sensible for the Swedes. Because whilst they might be more, let's be honest, politically inclined towards, uh, politically and culturally in terms of their views, inclined towards probably the British and the French side in World War II, and definitely after the invasion of Norway they are, but they're also surrounded by the Germans. And they prefer to they prefer to do a very heavily armed neutrality a la Switzerland than to end up in a war. Well, one of the often things is people sort of seem to presume that Hitler himself is uncorrupt, but considering the way he runs the appointments to various ministries as basically rewards for friends and people who he likes. I'd say that corruption starts right at the top. So, a second, so Scharnhorst is a panzer sheaf armament on a battleship hull, pretty much. Only today was informed they make wide frames so I don't have to have them uncomfortably diggling into the side of my head. Oh, seriously, Melanie. I, I, the, 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 you do seem to have some of the oddest luck. I'm glad you found out or found them out. But, yeah. I should have put up a picture of my mum and sister at some point with their wide frames. That would have helped. Jeff Brown. Hello, Jeff. Considering a question, considering the limits of German industry in 1950s, if you had designed light and heavy cruisers after the Panzer Chief were designed, what would you uh, make them look like? I wouldn't. If I was going to design light cruisers, I don't know, I'd probably take the free turrets, the triple turrets design, and I would just keep churning something out with two forward, one aft. And I'd just come with a generic light cruiser, and for the heavy cruiser, I'd just keep to a version of the Panzer Chief. As I said earlier, it would have free triple 11 inch turrets so basically i'd have a scale design i do sort of like volvo um as we all know volvo have a shaping and a styling and they just stretch it out to go for the bigger designs so i would have my form of my panzer sheaf with my two triple turrets forward triple turret aft dun 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 that's the arrangement and that made a basis and then i'd have my light cruiser with the same design And I wouldn't be building battleships or anything. But there again, again, as someone has commented already this week on one of my videos, it's a good job you weren't in charge of the uh, German procurement plan land. Yes, because I'd have built something which would have been a lot more difficult for the Allies to deal with. But I'd also probably got myself shot at some point for telling people that they were being idiots because I do not seem to have that filter to control that one. And Cox, I don't know which caliber might be useful for prolonged range missions. You can carry a lot more rounds. Yes. So, hold on. The gold fansante. As bureaucrats were known. Gold pheasants. Fat on corruption. Gold plated by stolen gold. On battleships, not, battle, not panzer chief. Yeah. On the Shan horse, it does make sense. But there again, if you design a 9 11 inch gun cruiser, which is bigger than the Panzer Chiefs, but not much bigger. It could well work. That's good. The thing that stands out for me in the German arms industry is the lack of standardization. There were as many variations for the from the design as engineers working them. Yep. And often they tried to build all of them. Just Funk, Hitler made a million selling his books, which was given to the happy couple during weddings. Oh, William Cox, remember uh, remember that a lot of Japanese production involved mum and pop on the street. Parachutes, clothing, tropical gear. gear. Mm. 
that's often overstated in Japan, the Japanese industry. A lot of the, the production plants are family owned, but they have some quite decent sized factories. They just do not have the infrastructure and logistics going to support them in wartime. So I found out. Yeah, now I'm hungry. Also, I'm going to cook today. Girl, now I found out about food. Cold is starving big time. Um, well, I could show you my lunch. My lunch was a pizza. It's there's still a bit of it. There's some of it sitting down there for my tea and possibly for breakfast tomorrow morning. I'll store it overnight properly. Dan Freeman, M class cruiser, battle, Leander class on it, battle class, uh, battle more class the uh, displacement. Um, let's see. So M class were planned to be. Excuse me. <coughs> well, they were designed to be eight and a half thousand tons or nine thousand three hundred tons in displacement. So. Town class displacement and Leander class armament. But I would say this I have very little hope of them keeping to it. The M class, though, were intended to be intended to use as a scout for the commerce raiding squadrons. And they were supposed to have a range of 8,000 nautical miles at 19 knots or 12,000 nautical miles at 19 knots, depending on their size. I do not know. I do not know. It's just... Look at this thing. Look at it. How is this going to be an efficient use of space? An efficient use of steel? I don't know, so the P class was terrible. Mm, they're not, they're not any improvements really, let's be honest. Uh, during a K. Um, what stopped the Germans in the 1930s from digging up the plants of the 38 70 guns from the bands and tweaking them? Didn't the Italians do something like that for the Latorias? The Germans didn't really have the plans in that there had been a very thorough job of destroying the German industry and tooling and the systems which had built those systems. So now they were just trying to design newer ones and they were trying to design them to be the latest designs and ideas of them. So that's what stopped them digging them up. Sadly. Would the channels be better with a fourth triple eleven inch turret? Well, it certainly wouldn't hurt them, but it's still an eleven inch turret. Thank you, William Cox and Dross Funk. Well, I walk from the kitchen where I'm watching my tablet into the lounge where I have the stream on my PC, and the stream on my PC is five minutes behind. I wonder how that's happened. Uh, that's good. More I meant for the instance of replacement parts for Tiger is it had to be handmade because there was much of, oh, what if we change this bit happening on the production line? Oh, yes. Tigers were pretty much individual machines. Every single one was slightly different from another. There is no such thing as standardization when it comes to a Tiger. This is what makes replacing them and fixing them in the field absolutely so difficult. And also one of the reasons why the Allies won World War II. It's amazing what happens when you can replace and re fix equipment in the field. It's amazing what can happen.
And uh, Bijan, efficient use of steel generally produces more steel than that, but the Soviets produce more tanks. Yeah, let's be honest. Some of the German claims on steel manufacture, I'm not quite sure I believe. Because either they had a lot of steel sitting around somewhere, and there doesn't seem to be huge amounts of steel found after World War II, or they aren't making as much as they say they are. So you've got, Alex, the M-Class, I don't think are a great solution to my earlier question. No, but they're pretty much the only solution available. <laughs> Thank you, Jack Ray. How are you doing? <sighs> What's the better battleship for its time, Bayon or Bismarck? Bane was a far better battleship for its time than Bismarck was. Bismarck, let's be honest, Bismarck looks good, but if the British had actually built a Lion class, we would not be talking about the Bismarck as much as we do. If she, and also, if the Bismarck had not scored the shot she did on Hood, we wouldn't be talking about it like we are now. I have Admiral Jellico is now a member. Thank you, Jack Ray, and thank you, Admiral Bo I think Admiral Jellico. <laughs> and he's talking about Mount of Steel. Pretty much. I think the British need to standardization on the Spitfire and the civilian craft aircraft. The British managed to achieve it, it took some some time, but they did actually achieve a level of standardization quite quickly. And the other thing is they achieved the standardization they had got them from the beginning and get-go. One of the things you have to remember about the Royal Navy, and this is one of the things which does both ha hampers aircraft design and all the other things, is the British uh, the Royal Navy keeps trying to standardize on a single engine. And then that engine in the horsepower race that's going on keeps being out horsepowered by others, and then the Royal Navy can go fudge. We can't sound like this on a single aerial engine. That's what. For example, to change the transmission on a Panzer IV, they had to remove the internals of the crew compartment, then rebuild it. Shown broke down as often, but easier to fix. Yeah. And the thing is, if a crew can fix something, it doesn't count as a major repair. Mission. So it's one of the German loss. I need to say more about production values. I read that since the tanks died so fast, they saw no need to make them perfectly. I think actually what you find is that there's a rush to make them. And there is a real rush to make them. But there are more Soviet... The Soviet tanks as a whole mostly come out okay. Okay, there are examples you can, in that vast volume, find examples of ones which are failing the testing. And coming out without the bits bit fitch. But also... There are a fair number of tanks which are making on their way, making to the front before they get to the new unit they're supposed to be assigned to. Some of the units on the way go, oh, we've got these parts missing on our current tanks. They're broken. Take it off. And you can do that. Because the Soviet tanks, for one of the better ways, are standardized enough that they can work. Which Admiral Jellicoe are in a Starfleet? I don't mind either. Both could be good options. Thomas Landon, generally like all semi-planned economies, is based on exaggerated output, big propaganda victories, and nobody asks about quality of numbers, not quantity. Equality is the motto. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it before. The Soviet steel statistics also don't mention quality either. I mean, most Soviet T-34 armor are cracked because of being not to the same standard as, say, a US armor plate. Again, though, you have an advantage that the British and the Americans had in that both sides, both those nations had been investing heavily in the infrastructure in the interwar years. And despite the fact that the second and then third five year plan of the Russians was supposed to be focusing on rearmament and building, well, for the second one on building the infrastructure to support rearmament and third one being actually being exploited to actually achieve rearmament. And neither one really got achieved anything, let's be honest. In a system where failure can result in you getting shot, how likely are you to report failure? Gosh, how much did the naval turret design influence tanks? 
Not as much you'd think. Mainly because tanks often have one gun, and most battles and most ships by this point have multi guns, and there's usually a lot more space. Let's be honest, the average turret on a ship, including even for ships which are broadly similar lines, let's say four inch. The space you would have for a four inch gun, a four inch gun, a pair of four inch guns in their mount versus a tank gun is colossally different and far more space to spread out to move around. I see. If Bismarck hadn't made that golden BB, we would probably be talking about what terrible German battleship that was, incredibly inefficient, and was sunk in its first engagement. Doesn't matter. Of course it works. I'd agree with that, but honestly, would you prefer to fight in the Red Army or say the US Army? Can I pick a Cromwell tank, please? If I have to pick between a Sherman or a T-34, I pick Cromwell. Uh, no, can't us, a bit of a redeeming quality in the Soviet military industrial complex is that they had to move it behind the Urals during Barbarossa. That's again a bit of a lie because the German, the, the Soviets had started moving the industrial com uh, complex to the other side of the Urals uh, long before that. In fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, that's part of the second five year plan of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or is it part of the third? It's, uh, yeah, the third five year plan actually starts in 1938. And it, they'd laid the infrastructure by building. They were supposed to build the railways and the communication systems to make it possible that they could move them around and that increase the coal in the oil industries and get them sorted. And then the third five-year plan would actually move the um, move the armaments from where they were to east. Uh, as well as constructing uh, additional military factories east of the Ural Mountains to provide them with the backup industrial capability they needed. There's actually someone who's written on the Wikipedia, and I did... I'm flicking through my two sources and flicked into Wikipedia as well. Uh, that's... Uh, I now have this note. Stalin's five-year plans helped transform the Soviet Union from an untrained society of peasants to an advanced industrial economy. Uh, it certainly spreads the industry out. I'm not sure if I could claim it would turn an entirely untrained society of peasants to an advanced industrial economy. That's a bit of a bid set. It turns it to an industrial economy. Doesn't matter. So if failures are not reported, why trust any of these statistics? I mean, a system built on a system lying. Uh, I don't trust what comes out of that, even the paper reality. Mm-hmm. Nearly before for some two. Interesting note: all the parade T-34s in current Russian service are Czech post-war war built. Aren't they Czech post-war builds bought from I don't know Venezuela or somewhere? I thought they were bought from a South American country. Let me see Just compare the percentage of people, the number of people manning a four-inch gun mounted on a ship versus a tank. Yes, there's basically twice a ship, uh, twice a tank's crew manning a single gun. Bought from Vietnam. No, I do. I, well, I don't think it's Venezuela. It's a V name country, but yeah. <laughs> T 
Come on, there we have it. Economics driven by politics, design driven by politics. And, well, that means politicians. And I don't trust the average politician to design a good tank. No. No, that's not usually what they're there for. So, summary German cruiser production. They had a, they had a vision which wouldn't have worked. They had a procurement plan which didn't match the vision. And what they actually built was in nowhere anywhere near the, all of them. And then they used them to try and fulfill the vision in a way they couldn't fulfill the vision because they sent, kept sending them out as penny packets. And the entire point of the vision had been to try and send them out as groups because mutually supporting forces would be far harder for the Royal Navy to destroy and disrupt than single ships and twin ship operations. See, Clark, by the time it comes to service, I'm not sure I'd pick a Cromwell over a Sherman. I like Cromwells. See, is it? Triple turret, turret Deutschland, would that make her a small battlecruiser like the Invincibles? Not really. It would make her a, basically the German equivalent of the Alaskas. And this is the point. This would make her a decent sized cruiser for their period. Would be actually interesting because I think if you'd had Deutschlands come out which were that, I wouldn't be surprised if you then had the Second London Treaty produce that as a design criteria, produce a new super cruiser, heavy cruiser, which would fit in a certain tonnage bracket. And the British might well have built some prior to World War II, which could then be very interesting, because what would the British arm them with? Let's say they were allowed to be built up to twelve with, with up to twelve inch guns, you know, the British would then have to have a twelve inch gun cruiser wandering around. The British would be very happy with a 12-inch gun cruiser. But then that would have turned a whole new naval race into it, into um, World War II. You'd probably have found them, the British would have designed and built them quite quickly. So you'd probably have had two to three into service when World War II began. Either, early 19, either 19, late 1939 or early 1940. My comments, C-54 or Sherman? I choose HMS Nelson, favourite platform for playing Macro Panzer. Well, you could always pick a tribal class destroyer. They do that quite well, and they like to take out trains. Cromwell, getting out of one is problematic. Check with Colonel Nix. Oh, the tank's on fire. So, segment on the Cromie. Yeah. See, Lord, my dad saw the Lorodney launcher fitted out when he was about 10. He never forgot the QAM bridge towering over Berg. Uh, the Queen's Anne Mansion bridge towering over Birkenhead. Ah. Oh, those were ships. The Nelson class were gorgeous. Trains? The HMS Unicorn picks up here as it goes. The I, want, I want to go hunting. Yep, that would not surprise me with that ship. That would not surprise me at all. So. Mainly because... You might not be able to hear it, but I am starting to lose my voice. I can tell from the feeling, because I've been talking so much today. So, last questions. Have you enjoyed tonight's good thing? Do you enjoy the fact it's the first of the Christmas series? And by the way, the videos for tomorrow, for um, Saturday, for Sunday are already planned. The one are already uploaded and ready to go. The ones for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are sort of those versions recorded. I'm not sure I like them. So, you know, they could well change. Hoping you're enjoying them all.
keep hitting the nine instead of the eight. That's annoying. Seen Richards weren't there talks about the 12 inch guns in the late 20s in the British camp. Yes, there were. And basically, they would have been responses. Basi uh, to an extent, the British are starting to think about what exactly they can do to deal with the Deutschland class. And if. I, I do think if the Germans had continued building Deutschlands and had built bigger, better Deutschlands, the British wouldn't have responded with war or anything like that, but the British would have responded with the construction, and possibly the French as well would have done so. But it's a kind of interesting thing to think about what would have happened if you do have super cruisers earlier on. The restaurant I'm in is already blasting uh, Christmas music. Is the Soviet Navy series still on? Yes. Soviet voice is your money of bread. The um, the Soviet one is ready to go tomorrow. That's going to be Friday's video. Then the German heavy cruisers long patrol is Saturday's video. Monday's videos is the commerce class. Tuesday's the Canada class. Wednesday's the Cresta class. Um, Patron sixty eight. Whatever you all vote for, which is going to go live tomorrow morning. The vote's going to go live tomorrow morning my time, and it's going to be running till Sunday. So patrons, please note you will have. Only a few days to vote. But those will decide the two topics for Christmas uh, for the Christmas period that the patron votes. And yes, I hope you enjoy them all. The Soviet series will go on, don't worry. Night night, visual. Take care. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, Code 85. You even wrote a song for the Soviet Cruiser series. That's interesting. There is actually a song included in the Cruiser series. A small heads up. There is a song coming in the first episode of the Cruiser series. Might be included in the in subsequent ones as well. Take care, Mike Newman. Thank you, Mark Harkness. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas Vanderdahl. Um, no, sorry. what were the German man torpedoes? Oh, you, you asked me about that. German man they were, oh, good lord. They were the niggers, weren't they? Which is a, actually translates to a very bad word these days, which no, I am not pronouncing, because I do not n wish to get into that particular, um, fight. Uh, especially when it's just because it's a German name for a, a Nazi German name for a man to a crew torpedo. It's a sort of interesting system because they sort of are a torpedo armed with a torpedo. If you ever see it, oh. Well. Right, so these are the Christmas videos we have coming up. The first of the fancy videos is going to be on Monday the 12th, which is I've sort of structured because that gives me time to get them actually ready. <laughs> I'm still working through the videos. And yeah, it's going to be fun. Christmas Day is going to be HMCS Hyder, with a little bit about Nubian tacked on at the end probably. And I hope you're enjoying the 60 second videos. There's another hot tub historian com one coming out tomorrow. I hope you're going to enjoy that. It's uh, Munro Doctrine to Manifest Destiny. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Errol. Hope you enjoyed. And I'm not going to end this with a question because I do that with the long patrols, but I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Newman. Thank you, Mark Harkness. Thank you, Thomas Van Adel. Thank you, Dirt Squad. William Cox. Dan Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, my admins, Melanie and Dan. Thank you for being part of this and helping out. Thank you, Brian Newman. Thank you, New York before for some too. 
Uh, would 15 inch turrets for Bismarck fit in Deutschland? Some sort of monitor. Uh, you, you could put 15 inch guns theoretically on them because you can fit them in the Shan horse, but the, you're going to require a lot of work to build enough 15 inch turret. Hit Todd Top Historian broadships, broadships. Well, let's put it this way. If I manage to be in a place with a hot tub when there is a brew ships, I will do a hot tub historian brew ships if you all really want it. But that will mean I will have to arrange to be in a place with a hot tub and have to have a friend there probably to be holding the camera to get it to work. <laughs> right then. So that will probably involve me bribing my camera crew. So I will have to, uh, the, you will see they are again involved on in HMS Warriors filming. So you will see my camera crew in HMS Warrior. Again, I managed to get them really involved. They did some dancing for me where Jackie Fisher used to dance. So I thought it was appropriate. Are those things they have two underslung torpedoes? No, it's one torpedo underslung what is basically an extended torpedo. Don't get me started on it. Thank you, Thomas Vanderbilt. Thank you, Million Sixty Forty. Thank you, Night Six Three Three One. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Just got in for the last minute. Sorry, Mike. Colin. Thanks, Mikey Newman, and thank you, Ron. They used to. I think they had a single on the slung torpedo. They go first. We want it. Yeah. Well, I have to bri. I have to bri with sufficient iron brew. My camera crew then. As said. Enjoy. Turn around. Suddenly I'm grateful Drac and I hit traffic. Well, the plan had been to have you and Drac as one of the dancing couples, Dan. So it would have been Drac and you, Glyn and his partner, his wife, and... My traditional pair, Sam and Richard. So, you know. You volunteer as cameraman for the hot tub. Eh, potentially. Potentially. But there again, you see, the thing is, if I don't bribe them to do it, they will then be upset with me. So I kind of have a little... I know, definitely know who the director is who's going to have to be there. It's going to have to be Sam. Because if she's not in uh, directing these things, she gets very, very upset with me. As all best friends do. Anyway, take care, everyone. Thank you, and enjoy. Doc, will you do a vid on the still working Clyde puffers? Well, uh, given the, I will do when I get to the Clyde. I want to visit. I've got to visit Glasgow, and I've got to go up there for some archive research, and I've got to get there next year at some point. And I keep trying to get there, and it keeps falling through. So at some point, I have got to actually get on off my behind and actually get up there. Admittedly, without having with having to rent cars, it's kind of interesting, but I'd probably go by train then. Because I could fly, but honestly, the whole package limitations when you want to stay up for a few days to do research and flying in the UK internally is seems absurd. But anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Take care. I'm off to rest my voice because I have to do more recording tomorrow. And I want to do more recording because I want to give you even more videos. Because this is going to be, as you can see, a lot of videos. And I haven't even included what the ones are going to be on the 4th of January, the 5th of January, and the 6th of January, and the 7th of January. It's going to be fun. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you for all your help.